from originally. We will be migrating uh, a lot of that functionality uh, to Elisa. Uh, for those of you that uh, may not have known Dave, Dave used to be our maintenance uh, person here and ran uh, all the maintenance uh, work. He retired last year. Uh, we hired Tim uh, shortly after we hired Elisa. Uh, and Tim now runs maintenance and, and, and manages the staff. So a lot of what we've tried to do over the course of the past year is migrate uh, the day-to-day -day operations away from having board involvement uh, to empowering Elisa, uh, Gary, and, uh, and Tim uh, to make those decisions and run the association. We don't, or I should say run the property. We don't need to get involved in every decision as it relates to somebody not showing up for work. And there was a point where we were doing that, those kind of things. And, uh, um, you know, I have a day job. I don't live here. None of us live here really other than uh, Boyd. So we don't have that day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with, with owners. We don't have the day-to-day -day interaction with staff. Um, so that was a big part of what we, uh, what we were trying to transition. You guys want to add anything? We do want to try and strengthen our, uh, committees, bolster them with more people, getting more involved. And we're hoping people will do that. Okay. Any questions? If not, I want to go to the website and you can kind of navigate through that and point out the, the things that are there. So um, <coughs> Gary manages our website. Virtually everything tied to um, Tamron can be found here. Um, it is a publicly facing website. Uh, it is uh, you know, leveraged not only by owners, but we have realtors that get to it to get information on insurance policies or get information, you know, full documents. Uh, with title companies that access it, so it is, uh, it is outwardly facing, so that any uh, uh, any owner, any prospective owner, anybody shopping for property, uh, has access and, and can uh, uh, can dig into this. It's a it is a living, growing website. Uh, things get added all the time. Um, you know, we've uh, we've added several things in the last years or so, just because we we put a maintenance system in place and an accounting system in place and some things to make assessment payments easier. Uh, so it changes all the time. Um, I certainly encourage you to, 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 to look at it. Um, Gary, you wanna walk through it? Sure. Um, homepage, uh, I, I encourage people to uh, occasionally get on, uh, click on the Facebook link because there's stuff that's added to the Facebook, our Facebook page probably more often than is added on the website. Um, and, and individual owners can post things on there if they are a member of the Tamron Facebook community. Um, board of Directors page just lists all the Board of Directors if you want any information. Um, you can look for it there. Joe Carey is the um, Board Appointed Treasurer. John Needling, Board Appointed uh, Secretary. Um, news and events page. This is probably the page that changes the most or the most often. Um, I try to put things on here that are of interest. These notices, I've been adding these notices as time goes on for particular things that are happening uh, throughout, the, throughout the property. Um, the massage and relaxation, that's something that is just starting up. The, the room is right back here. Um, it's the, it used to be a storage room right here. They've set that up as a massage area. Um, I, I encourage people to come to the news and events page because it has the more interesting stuff. Now, if you want to read HOA documents and get bored to death, you can do that. But um, I think the news and events page has more interesting things. In particular, there's only 52 days left for the golf season. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and then I update this map. We're still winning. I, I, I try. I'm sorry. I said we're still winning. <laughs> Texas, <laughs> still winning. Texas is still winning. Yeah, they're um, 86. Yeah, close, although I think that has changed just recently. <laughs> um, I've got to. I've got to update this. But this just shows how many owners are from from the different states. Um, click on a, a few other things down here for other news. Uh, if you haven't seen, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie Avalanche, um, we're going to be showing that, I think, in the restaurant uh, probably 
during uh, snowdown weekend. I believe they're going to have snowdown this year, aren't they? It's still up in the air. I still up in the air? Okay. We'll schedule a time for uh, to show Avalanche. And then I uh, <clears throat> put the results of the golf tournament on here. There's a video clip of the 2018 golf tournament. Um, we didn't get many pictures from 2019 or 20. Um, anyway, there's just a couple of video clips there. Um, let's see. I won't go through everything here, but um, on the Tamron page, you can click to see schematic drawings of all of the different units. This all comes from, these are all uh, drawings from the 1970s and 1980s that we had, we found them and I've scanned them all and put them, put them up here. They're not gonna bear any resemblance except for the overall measurements to uh, what the units look like uh, these days. Um, HOA documents page we looked at. Again, as Scott said, a lot of information regarding the, all, all the governing documents are there, insurance information. Uh, we ask all of the realtors to have a copy of these property transfer forms in with their closing, uh, in, with, with the closing documents. Sometimes that works, and sometimes not so well. Um, amenities, I just updated this page. It's got a little slideshow of the pool and fitness. Uh, Linda Logan, who does hair, just updated this with um, uh, Gabby and Jennifer's uh, information on reflexology and massage. Um, <clears throat> committees, that's the one I mentioned, has to be updated. Um, let's see. Owner listing, this gives right down here a link to our owner directory. It's password protected, and I periodically send out the password to everybody. Um, most people lose it and they ask again, and you know, I'll just send it out again, but that gets changed on a semi-regular basis. Oops, how are we gonna do that? Um, anybody just, that just you, so you know, on that owner listing, if nobody's looked at it, it is an opt-in, so it's not 100% complete. It's not there's not contact information for everyone. If it's an opt-in situation, so just know that if you look at it, if you're trying to track somebody down, they may or may not be on that. I think there's about two thirds. About two thirds of the owners are on that list. About 230. Uh, I'm sorry. About 230. 230. Okay, so it's yeah, it's a it's about two thirds. Um, and if you take a look and your information's not on there and you want it to be, just let me know and I can add it. Alisa uh, manages that. Contact us page has all the uh, telephone numbers and email addresses of anybody that you need to contact. And by the way, um, on a lot of the pages, not all of them, there's a link to the latest uh, Tamron newsletter. This one just got posted yesterday. Um, our thanks to uh, Ann Stokes for doing that. Um, this is the second page that I encourage people to go to all the time, the telecom information page. If you wanna know anything about TV, phone and internet, go to that page. This tells you how to set up voicemail, although I, I advise people not to do it. Um, instead, I would buy a cordless answering machine telephone and program it as you wish, because you don't get any visual cues in this system as to whether or not you have a message waiting. Um, anything on the internet is here. If you ever wanna test your speeds, click on any of these to do a speed test. All the television stuff is here. Um, information regarding Glacier Club is here. And if you have questions about water and sewer, uh, let's see, the, um, I believe I have a link to Elbert Creek. Uh, yeah, right here, there's the Elbert Creek, Creek Water Company. That's who we get our water and sewer from. That's who we're in negotiations with. Um, you can contact them uh, if, you, if you want. Um, I, 
Last year, I was posting updates on the COVID-19 page on a fairly regular basis, probably three or four times a week. Um, I've been doing it about once a week now, uh, only because there, there are far fewer updates in Durango. The Durango Herald does not have a link um, to the coronavirus that they used to have, um, and they would post updates. But I get the these numbers from various websites as far as cases and all are concerned. And then I just deleted a whole bunch of notices and information and online articles uh, a few days ago and uh, pared that down. Base camp restaurant, anything you want to know about base camp is on here. And there's a link to their website, uh, merchandise. And I think Elisa will have things to say about that. These are different uh, Tamron branded merchandise items that we have uh, for sale. There's some in the back here that you might want to take a look at. <clears throat> if you stop into our office, we have more of those. Um, and we get these through uh, Greg and uh, uh, Ann Stokes through Sanmar. We get a lot through, through Sanmar. Uh, some of the other things we get from another company. Um, and we still have uh, quite a bit of the vintage Tamron dinnerware, if anybody is interested. <laughs> but you can Please. find, and, and by, by the way, I'm going to put a plug in for this. This hat right here. Elisa found these patches. They're about this big. I think they're two and a half inches or so. Mm -hmm. Two, two and a half inches. These are old patches and it says Tamron uh, Inn and Golf Club. These are from, they have to be from the 80s. So we found those. And then I happened to find this black hat, this black baseball cap with orange trim. Mm -hmm. It's almost exactly the same orange. So we had one back there. We had, um, we ordered a bunch of hats. And we took the patches and had them sewn on. A guy downtown does that. And uh, it was kind of, I, I think these are kind of cool. Anyway. Um, too much time. Uh, if you pay online, you can go to pay lease. Uh, Vintium is a, is a platform where you can uh, submit um, maintenance requests. So click on those and learn about those. I just started this buy sell thing and people should have seen this a while ago. Um, if you have some significant items that you want to sell, send me some pictures, send me some information and we'll put them on here. Um, if you've got mismatched dinnerware and all that, you don't want to put it on there. <laughs> Uh, we've had a variety of things on here and they've sold. So. Uh, and then lastly, all the information for the annual meeting, everything that's happening today and tomorrow is on the annual meeting page. That will go away uh, sometime next week. Questions? <clears throat> there is a link also to the Facebook page here. I think you scroll through it a few times. I think we've got 100 and about 150, I think now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I think it's about 150. Okay. Um, that's what I, that was the latest that I saw, I think. Yeah, I mean, we try to, uh, I have encourage people to communicate on here. Um, I will tell you that there is some policing of it. So if somebody, you know, puts something tacky out there, or we get things that we don't think are appropriate, then they won't get posted. Um, but we're hoping that this can be a, you know, a good vehicle for communication as well. Um, you know, we have been doing the quarterly newsletter now for, I don't know, two years, I guess, something like that. Um, so that also is, a, you know, a, a vehicle that we use for communication. Um, but again, we encourage everyone to participate if you've got ideas. You know, Gary's here all the time. Uh, you can email any of, any of the folks on the board. Um, again, you know, we, we, we do our best to, uh, you know, to communicate things uh, where necessary. And, um, and any anybody that wants to get more involved, you're welcome to to, to step up because we're all volunteers and we like to help. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I I just wanted to uh, take exception to my esteemed uh, colleague Gary, uh, who implied that the that the documents are not interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I implied it. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. spoken from an educator. I find them spellbinding. And especially the declarations of uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. You, you, you should not pass that. Uh, being a little facetious, but I would say this a lot of us buy a place in a, in a condo uh, community like this, and we don't read the documents. And, you know, probably to be honest, you know, you really should. And I realize a lot of it will be kind of boilerplate, uh, some of it's legalese, but, but really the policies that govern the, the association, the rules and regs that we um, pass and, and administer, uh, it probably is in everyone's best interest that everybody becomes familiar with those things. So as new owners particularly, I would encourage you to um, try to take the time and, and the energy to uh, to read through them. Thank you for sharing that. I, I will Shame tell you that you. we rely 100% on him to remind us of the things that uh, are in those documents. So, I, yeah, I think the other point to make is that this board or anybody who sits on this board, you know, if this is not a fiefdom. There, Colorado has laws that, that dictate how condominium associations are operated. And then these are our local documents, which take the state law and make this association what it is. Uh, and most of what you see there can't be changed without your vote. So when you see things out there and you go, well, I don't, I don't like that. Uh, remember that your predecessors or maybe yourselves actually voted for those rules and regs and documents to be in place. So don't shoot a board member. Um, <laughs> All right, um, so we got about two minutes left. Um, I don't want to rush anything, but is, do people have questions about anything we've covered? Any, the, uh, the idea of this is, is to really kind of give you an overview of how we operate, where to find information. Um, so if there are questions, that would, would be appropriate or we can, uh, we can move on to the, uh, to the candidates. Okay. <clears throat> I want to do this. I'm going to get an alphabetical order. Yeah, I remember when I'll just go in the order that they're listed here. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah. I know. All right, uh, this boy dialed in. Can you hear me? No. Yes, Ron. All right. Good, good morning. Just wanted to check in. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Hot. It's a beautiful day here. Hot. He's in Houston. Come on. <laughs> That's his problem. <laughs> just, just remember, I know where you live. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the next um, the next uh, agenda item. So, as everyone knows, um, our this is at the time of year we voted new board members. Um, uh, I'm stepping down. I'm turned out. Eric's stepping down. He's turned out. These are the candidates listed on the website. Um, I was just going to go in the order as they're listed here. Um, we did just text Boyd. He um, Boyd is an existing board member. Has been a board member two years. Is that correct? So four, four years. Four years. Four years. Something like he that. He filled the term. He filled, he filled it. That's right. Yeah. Got right. Got like it, so, okay. Yeah. So Boyd is resident here. Um, <clears throat> Boyd is a, uh, I guess, a banker by background. Um, He's been a, a you know a great board member for us um, because he's got a good financial background and that's definitely comes in handy and then uh, you know a lot of admittedly a lot of what we rely on with uh, with the board members that we have is what is their individual expertise and and what does that bring to the table so it you know it always varies every time we uh, you know the, the board shifts um, Boyd is not going to call in um, but uh, you know he he did submit his resume. Yeah, I just got an update on that. Boyd is actually one of our working board members. He's actually on the conference call. He will be available for questions in about 20 minutes. Oh, okay. So we'll, we'll finish with him. I don't know if he's going to log in or die. He's going to dial in, right? He's, he's usually so we're going to wait for Boyd. Uh, we'll cover him at the end. Um, as far as rules of the road here, you know, we've got 30 minutes. Um, I don't want to rush this. We can certainly drag it on if we need to, but. My thought is, you know, four or five minutes per person. Uh, it's typically what we've done in the past. Introduce yourselves, talk about your background, talk about your desire to get on the board. Um, you know, uh, what your, your time here, what your interests are, whatever you want to cover. Uh, you know, certainly uh, we encourage you to do so. As of uh, yesterday, day before, I think we've got 175 or so ballots in. So there's certainly some that are still floating around, and uh, you know, we accept ballots up until. Uh, the owners meeting tomorrow um, so you can certainly turn them in earlier um, and for those of you who may not be aware we historically have always done this by paper um, we mail out ballots uh, and people either mail them back in or they submit them in person uh, when they're here we did this year initiate electronic voting everybody should get an email on that uh, the idea uh, behind that is to slowly migrate away from uh, having paper ballots and spending fifteen hundred dollars a year mailing out a bunch of paper. Um, this is the first year we've uh, we've done the electronic voting, and I think we're about a 50-50 split between those that submitted by paper and those that submitted by ballot. But you are free to do so. Uh, the electronic way. voting is over. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now I if stand you haven't voted, paper you, you need to bring a, a ballot to the meeting. Okay. 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 Cool. Thank mail you. Mail and electronic, right? Sorry, mail and electronic. We can't. The electronic is is ended at last night at five o'clock. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. If you mailed it in, um, it needed to get to the L to the Medi Medals and Associates yesterday by five o'clock. Yeah. So, yeah. But so you, you can to bring a ballot to the meeting tomorrow. Right. Okay. So we'll start with John because he's uh, the next on the sure. list. Uh, hi, I'm John Niebling. Um <clears throat> I was earlier introduced as the secretary. <clears throat> Let me clarify that. There are two positions, two board officer positions that are not necessarily elected board members, and that would be the secretary can be an owner who is not a board member, as the treasurer can also be a non board member officer. So, in my case, I am currently the secretary of the board, but not a board member. Now, I, I was a board member in the past for a couple of terms. In fact, um, spent a couple of uh, years. Uh, two of the most memorable years of my life <laughs> as, as the president of the world of our lives. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and um, so, so I have quite a bit of experience as a board member. Uh, also, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm currently secretary. I've also been secretary in the past. And uh, one of the responsibilities, of course, in uh, being secretary is to be familiar with those documents that I encourage you to read. So um, I, I feel like that's I, you know, that's one thing I would uh, point out to uh, those of you who are new and maybe voting for the first time that um, having, having experience on the board in the past and then even currently, 
uh, think it was helpful uh, as a as a candidate, or would be helpful if I can return to the board. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a I'm a retired uh, community college educator. Uh, spent my entire career in actually in Arizona and New Mexico as first a teacher, then administrator, and, and finally uh, ended up as president of the Clovis Community College in Clovis, New Mexico, that some of you may be familiar with. And so given that kind of experience, I think it, it has prepared me to deal with a lot of the things that boards deal with. <laughs> Uh, in fact, you know, I, as the college president, I of course reported to the board, and also, you know, in that role, you 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 have to be intimately familiar with the with the policies of the college. You have to implement them fairly and make sure that that everybody, as much as possible, is a participant in all the processes, administrative processes that come with that. Um, I think also that the the uh, just as part of that experience, um, it, it, for, it forced me to um, learn about uh, things that I was not familiar with as a teacher. And that is um, during my tenure, both at San Juan College down in Farmington and then over at Clovis, uh, I had to supervise the, uh, or be at least liaison between the, the college and contractors, architects, et cetera, in terms of building fairly significant buildings. Now, I don't, I don't think that we're going to be building any buildings, <laughs> but uh, trust me, we have some buildings that need some attention. And I think these are the challenges that we're going to be facing. Um, we mentioned the roof committee, and I think those guys are really on top of it. Um, drum roll. <laughs> it, was, it was a joke. I was trying to be um, uh, but then again, the, the not only what's on top of these buildings, but what's behind the walls of these buildings and what is in the ground, particularly that's carrying water. These are the challenges that are going to be facing us in the near future. And, and every one of those things has a price tag. So I think the, my personal opinion is that as we move into the future, I mean, there are a million things that could be done. And, and we're always looking to improve the quality of life for, all of our owners. But I think this, the coming board is going to be faced with some very, very serious challenges in terms of infrastructure. So I think having a familiarity with how things work, how water is developed, how electricity is delivered, and so on and so forth, is probably a valuable thing. So I, I think as part of my background, having been responsible for putting those kinds of things together for college would be something that maybe I could uh, rely upon to assist uh, the association in making sure these things get done. Uh, obviously, another thing that, that in my line of work, um, I was given a budget every year. And we had to pay for salaries, we had to pay for supplies, we had to pay for whatever the college did. Likewise, every year the board proposes and passes a budget. And that budget, of course, has to be administered and efficiently making sure that and it has to be it has to be thought through in advance and obviously there are things that come up and they will tell you um, that you can't count on but basically preparing an administrative budget making sure that everything that needs to be taken care of is taken care of and of course as i mentioned uh, part of my background is let's put it this way um, <clears throat> in my line of work <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it was not a good idea to not stay with anybody so we kind of understand. I think having said that, I'll just turn it over to the next okay. uh, candidate. Thank you very much for your time. You kept it right at five minutes. Okay. So that's, that's <laughs> going to be our rule now that I have a software for you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Jerry, you're next. So Jerry Q2, um, Jerry's been involved on the, uh, with us on, on the board in the past. He's also been um, active on, on many of the committees. Um, the negotiations we've been on have ongoing with uh, ECWC on water. We would not be where we are at today without Jerry's involvement. So, Jerry. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Good to see you. Uh, so, I am running for the board again. Uh, I was on the board from 2014 to 2017 and served as treasurer for two of those years. Um, when I joined the board in 2014, 
it was a very uh, tense time for the association. We had all kinds of internal infighting. We had fighting between us and Glacier Club. Um, we had problems with personalities even on the, on the board um, clashing. Uh, so it was a very contentious and difficult time. And so um, I joined the board to try to help out. And, and I think that um, over a period of the next uh, several years, uh, things changed fairly dramatically for the positive. And in fact, um, I think for the last six years, there has been continuing improvement in what the association has been able to do through the leadership of the board. And I commend the existing board. I think um, they have been uh, tremendous. And I would also point out that uh, Scott and Eric have been instrumental in all of the improvements that we all are enjoying now, and they will be sorely missed um, over the next term. Um, I said I served as treasurer. I also served as um, uh, uh, the leader of several committees, including documents review committee, because we had to come into compliance uh, with the um, Colorado Common Interest Owners uh, Ownership Act, um, and uh, also with an assessment review uh, committee, because we had to do something to uh, codify our our uh, our assessments and try to explain being be able to explain them to owners uh, so that they made sense and they could understand them. I also served as, uh, I think, as most rookies on the board do, as a, as chair of the Rules and Regulations Committee, which is always <laughs> yeah. uh, careful what you ask for when you get on the board. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as many of you know, uh, I hope uh, Joe Carey has been um, on the board in the past for many years. Uh, he is the guy who knows everything there is to know about about Taco and Tam Tamron. And he has served very ably and extremely well as treasurer for many of those years. And so it was un under his tutelage that I learned about, about all of the association's finances when I was treasurer on the board. Um, that, was, that was invaluable. I also worked with our legal team, our two uh, legal counsel, um, Ken Golden and Christina Landryu, on several issues that we had before us and, and dealt successfully with those and developed a good relation, working relationship with our legal counsel. So um, now I think it, uh, the reason why I'm running again um, is that even though things are, are really on the right track here at Cameron, um, there will be a little bit of leadership vacuum with uh, Scott and uh, Eric leaving and that many of the people on the board that, that are remaining, although they're excellent board members, um, they don't have the, the depth um, of background for uh, dealing with the association's issues. Uh, we bought our first unit in 2010, and I can say that I have attended almost every single board meeting since 2010, so that even when I wasn't on the board, I followed very closely all of the business that, that the association is involved in. I look forward to doing that again. The final thing I'll say is that um, one of the first appointments that I had was to serve as the liaison with Glacier Club and working out a new contract for water and sewer. That was extremely important because our, our existing agreement with them expired in 2013 and it governed how we were being charged for our water and sewer. Also, at the same time, our water and sewer rates have been escalating to where in 28, by 2018, they were well over $400,000 a year. And after, after salaries and benefits for employees, it was the single largest uh, budget item that we had. It occurred to me when I was working on this that, that we were being overcharged. And so I worked quite hard at um, trying to get Glacier Club and now Elbert Creek Water Company, which took over the water and sewer business for them, to adopt new uh, state-of-the-art uh, best practices for developing rates for all the customers. And along with developing a new agreement, um, the other important part was getting our rates down to where they needed to be. And we have already succeeded now after seven years of work and, and great participation by the other 
water and sewer committee members, we have success, succeeded in getting our water and sewer rates down into the $300,000 uh, area each year. And they should be stable and they are equitable for all of, all of the uh, customers. So I'm quite proud of that work as, uh, as I am in, in the rest of the committee members and the agreement. I'm not gonna say anything more about that right now. I'm gonna let, let Scott uh, address that. Yeah, we'll later. cover that in the, in the board. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, TP. Good morning, TP Larkin. Uh, our previous candidates just pretty much outlined a lot of stuff that I was gonna talk about in the sense that uh, we've been here I think this is our 20th year. So we've gone through everything you've heard. And uh, I agree that we're moving into an era where we're gonna have some serious construction, replacing the pipes, upgrading roofs, et cetera. Uh, we also, in my opinion, in the last five years, have changed our entire ownership of this resort going from rentals to part-time rentals to long-term rentals. And I think we now see, I don't know the percentage, maybe somebody does, but we have a tremendous amount of people who are living here full-time. During this last 10 years of what you've already heard about, there has been some changes within our rules and regs. There has been some changes philosophy-wise. However, we haven't brought it up to the point of what do we do with people that live here full time versus the people that are running next door to them versus the people who are living full time in the lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I feel that needs to be addressed big time. Secondly, in my, my major, I have so many points I could share, but I only have five minutes. So I'll hit my highlights. I've been a general contractor for 42 years. Um, everything that Eric has done putting together our long-term plans and improvements, I feel with my experience, I can really add a lot to the entire package of our board. So each one of these people that are here now and whoever gets elected, I can, they can lean on me if they want additional information than what's being provided within our own operation. I've met with Tim several times since he's been here. He has a upgraded positive futuristic thought pattern for where this resort could go. And I think between him, our new board members are existing and input from our owners, we can move this into 2021 and cover it for the next whatever. That pretty much sums it up. I ski, I kayak, my wife Lynn was over here. Um, we spend about three months a year. We wanna spend more slowly but surely as I get older, I think I will. And I hope that you vote for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Dawn. Dawn just being up front, or is this okay? Oh, well, you got to make a mockery of yourself. You got to be up front. <laughs> hey, Dawn. <laughs> just, okay. Dawn, just make sure we can, the, the uh, like microphone can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm Dawn Carter. I live near 861 in Chinatown. I'm a full time resident now and I'm retired from Conoco Phillips Oil Company in uh, March on March 7th of this year. But I've pretty much been living here full time since March of last year when COVID hit and we started working from home. I haven't been here at the time, it was awesome, but I have to say. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit differently, I think. I think we kind of got into it a little bit. So this is my home. This is where I live year round. I want it to be treated like my home. Um, I think there's a lot of rules and regulations that are good out there. Um, I think some of them is, have been there a while and need to be looked at a little differently and changed. Um, I think they need to be changed to where they can be followed a little easier. Um, I see certain rules out there that I know folks aren't following and it's because maybe they can't be followed as well. I see people who know all the rules and regulations <laughs> That aren't following them. I know they're supposed to be fine. Fines are great. And I think um, by changing them, we can still have the fines, but they can be where they can be followed, where they feel like this is our home. We live here. And um, you guys have talked a lot about the construction, the water, that type of thing. Yep, not my background, but that's okay because 
we were just talking earlier that the committees are made up of other owners. So those committees don't have to be led by a board member, which means we can pull in people like Jerry and TP if they're interested in helping out still being owners of having condos. Um, there's been some conversations about who's been here, who's been on the committees, who hasn't. Um, if you don't bring new blood in, things are never going to change. It's always going to stay the same. And you can't rely on the same people forever because eventually they're not going to be able to do it. So you've got to continue bringing new blood in. I'm not young, but I'm not real old yet. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so I just feel like I live here. I want to have a say in what's going on more than just a vote here and there. I want to be able to have more discussions around how things are done here. So, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, Mark, last but not least, we got Boyd, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Mark, yeah, Mark, I I'll apologize. All of the rules and regulations. Just before you start, uh, I apologize in advance. We are expecting Boyd to call in if the phone rings. You I apologize. Stop. No, okay, thank you. And this is Kathy. Kathy's our other board member. So my name is Mark Boyd. I'm known maybe a third of the people here because I've talked to a lot of people since. Mark, you might want to get closer to the mic here because there's a bunch of people online. I have a lot of voice to use. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my, wife, <laughs> my wife is Cindy. She sits right here. So my name is Mark Beliz. I cannot talk about all the things I've done on the board in the past because I haven't served on the board in the past, but I can talk about my background that I think um, qualifies me uniquely to serve on the board in the future. So I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up across the street from the golf course. Starting in high school, I worked at a golf course. I was a greens kid at a golf course. So in my high school years, that's how I learned how grass grows. Um, I came to Colorado and went to Fort Lewis. I came to Fort Lewis to speak. I ended up studying geology. Why? I don't know. There's a lot of geology in this part of the country. Um, I graduated from Fort Lewis. While I was at Fort Lewis, um, had to earn a living to try to get through school. And I did that as a um, everything, but in the summers I worked in, in the plumbing business. I was a plumber's helper. So I understand plumbing. If I go, you go downtown, I can start pointing to some of the places that I ran copper pipe. Um, I know how that stuff works. After Fort Lewis, I went off to School of Mines. School of Mines, anybody that's familiar with that institution, you're an engineer first and then you're whatever you want to be. So I went to School of Mines and I graduated from School of Mines with a master's degree on the geologic engineer. After that, I went into the mining industry from School of Mines. I was with Union Carbide initially. I served as a planning engineer. I, my job was planning. So there's a qualification that was uniquely um, qualified for this board. I um, moved to South Texas in 1978. So I'm another Texan. I still live in Texas. I live in Plano, um, which is north of Dallas, but work. I left Carbide in about um, 1980, and for 35 years, I worked for another mining company. I started as an engineer. I ended as vice president of health, safety, and environmental affairs for that company. I retired in 2013. Um, during that time, I served on the board of Texas Mining Reclamation Association. I was chairman of that board. Um, I served as uh, on the board, and I am still on the board of the Uranium Producers of America. Um, I served as president of that organization. And um, again, I retired as, as senior vice president of health, safety, and environmental affairs. As a, during, as, with those responsibilities, we dealt with water rights. <laughs> We dealt with permitting, um, regulations in the uranium industry, a lot more than we've got here. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with that. <clears throat> Currently, I'm semi-retired. Um, I serve on the board of a um, another junior mining company right now. I'm an independent board member. So I'm familiar with boards. Um, and that's me, and I'll answer questions on that. Where I see a strong my, my um, um, involvement with Tamron, again, haven't been on the board, but I see that I have um, several things that I contribute. First is my, my um, principles, and my principle is primarily that the board needs to be very visible to the owners of Tamron. 
this board has done a tremendous job. When Cindy and I came in and decided we're going to move back to tent to Durango for um, a period of time, they Durango back in um, 2014, we went up and down, and this was obviously the place that we were going to call our summer home. We lived here from the end of May to um, the beginning of October when the leaves change, and then we come back to ski. Um, so my, my guiding principles and then my policies, maybe everybody here has had at least one, maybe two letters from me. Those were always in response to something else. My, um, my, my policies will be one, that I think the, the board has to reach out to the members of Cameron. I hate to say surveys because the minute you say that, everyone says survey, you're not going to do another survey. But I think the board needs to reach out more because I've heard from people that I've talked to, we don't hear, the board doesn't listen to us. And I don't think that's a problem with the board. I think the board just needs to reach out more because the expectation can't be that everybody reaches in. Um, surveys. Once that is complete, the second thing maybe more will be a little bit more um, um, creativity in how we deal with some of the, the property owners' issues. Don mentioned this: the rules. The rules aren't bad. The rules have got to either be followed 100% or the rules need to be changed. One of the two. Um, I think that we can look at the rules right now we can, and go through every rule and walk through the complex and find a rule that isn't uh, being complied with. So it can't be um, you know, selective compliance with the rules. Um, I think that we need to look hard at demographics. Everyone I talk to, my complex or my pod down in Gamble Oaks, there's one unit they now out of all of them that is a rental unit. All the rest are either 100% lit or 50% lit. So it's changing. And I hear and I and I, I speak with a charter owner, if you will, yesterday um, about Tamron 1974 through Tamron now. And it's changed. The lodge has gone from a hotel to something less than a hotel, and, and the outlying units are becoming homes. So this has to be would be reflected in the way that I think places manage. Um, but again, we don't know what those, those those answers to those questions are until we go out and ask people, how about mm -hmm. what are they doing now here in terms of their living condition? But project, what are we going to do in five years? Because in five years, I've heard a number of people say, well, we're renting now, but in five years, it's going to be home. So we need to account for that. And then finally, what's near and dear to my heart is a priority is I want to get involved and I, I, I think we can spruce up our grounds. I've got the background to do that. I heard today that there's been a committee that sort of fell apart on landscaping. Several um, times. Several times. <laughs> Whoever is but we also have a great staff now. I will request that the president appoint an, an, that as another committee and I'll be glad to serve as chair, either elected or not. So that <laughs> is where I am. Please ask me questions, and uh, I think I can see you in five minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Boyd is on the phone. Um, Boyd, we've been giving everybody five minutes. If you uh, want to just maybe give a quick overview of your background um, and your, you know, participation on the board, and then to the extent there's questions, people can pose those as well. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Boyd Hodges, uh, age 65, Pinecone. I've uh, been a full-time resident at uh, Tamaron since 2006. Um, I've served uh, over the last 15 years up in the president and CEO of two different banks uh, in, in Durango. Um, I, uh, I've been on the board. I was uh, appointed on the board, uh, I believe, four or five years ago, and then I was elected to a full term three years ago. And um, uh, been been active with the board on it. Um, I uh, uh, being a full time resident, I've, I've been out some with uh, um, taking care of my parents some last year. And then, sorry, I'm not there today, but I suffered a knee injury uh, at uh, Tamron a couple of weeks ago, and uh, so I'm kind of laid up right now. But I will be back next week. Um, I think one thing I can bring is 
Um, you know, I, I know the staff well. I'm there. Um, you know, like I said, I, I kind of consider myself a boots on the ground being a full-time resident there for that many years and know most uh, everybody there and uh, just a great place to live. I'm going to keep living there and, and enjoy it very much. So, Scott, anything else? Or, you know, no. Anybody have a question for Boyd? <clears throat> but you have a question, Ronald? Not for Boyd, no. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so boy, thanks. One thing I would before give me one sec, Ron, but um, before we move on, are there any questions of, for any of the candidates? Does anybody have any questions they want to they want to address for the candidate specifically? If because we really didn't take the time in the five minutes, so if there are some, bring it up now. Yeah, Ron, I have two questions. Uh, uh Jerry, you served uh for an extensive period of time on a very important committee, the assessment committee. Would you address uh, that experience, the outcome, and what you foresee this new board being capable of doing insofar as studying and updating our assessments? Thanks for the question, Ron. Um, assessments was one of the issues that I did deal with uh, in, a, in a big way when I was on board. Um, what I found was that going back doing lots of research on the history of Cameron and how assessments were originally imposed and then how they morphed over the years. When the condos were first built uh, more than 40 years ago, the assessments on each unit were predicated on two different things. One was the square footage of each unit and the other factor that went in uh, was that all uh, for some expenses, uh, each unit should pay equally regardless of their size because certain things didn't depend on the size. For example, what we pay for legal fees, the legal counsel. Uh, but other things <coughs> like maintenance and, and whatnot, um, the larger the units, the, the more the cost of, of maintaining them. So that's it started out that way. And what happened, and it was uh, at that point, approximately 70% of the assessments that were paid were uh, based on square footage of individual units and 30% were equally distributed among all units. What happened over, over the next few decades was that there's <coughs> changes that were being made year to year um, and that we wound up with a situation where in some cases, smaller units we're paying more in assessments than the larger units. And it appeared to me that that issue should be addressed. And there were many uh, owners who uh, were interested in getting that rectified. So I worked on that with a committee. Uh, Rick was a member, Rick was a mm -hmm. member of that committee. Um, and we, we came up with something that we thought would be more equitable because where we are today is that where we, it's almost a flip of what we had originally when the condos were built. Today, it's closer to, on average, 70% of the assessments um, are per unit, and 30, only 30% 30 are based on square footage. And so these things, I thought we should maybe take a look at and see if we could get enough momentum to, to change them. Problem was, the people became, the owners were very familiar with what they were already paying. They knew what they were going to be paying before they bought. And there was little impetus among many of the owners to change what the structure of the assessments was. So although we made recommendations to the board, the board did not adopt those recommendations. And instead, which I think is probably the next best thing in my opinion, was to codify <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and what Joe had been doing was pressure uh, for quite a few years. I don't know how many exactly. Uh, Joe could probably answer this. Was each year as our expenses went up and we had to set a new budget, what he would do is basically increment everybody's assessments by the same percentage. So once those were set, it was they, the assessments were raised equitably based on what they already were. And so what the board did, eventually did, was just say, we will fix what the structure is um, and we will continue to do the same. 
and now uh, we have uh, written policies that, that anybody can look up and see uh, and, and understand what, what the assessment's done. I, I don't know if that <coughs> satisfactorily addresses your question. Or not. I'd like to follow up if I could. Um, what do our declarations call for insofar as assessments are concerned? What hey, do Ron, they call Ron, for Ron, today? Ron, no, yeah. We're not going to get into that now. We no. will be dealing with this forever. If we want to talk about getting into assessments again, have a committee, we can do that. But we all know what we went through three years ago, four years ago. We had a committee, we went through the process. The ownership in general has not said word one about assessments since that time. So if we want to address it, we can address it, but I don't want to derail the meeting. Okay. Can I make a comment, yeah. Scott? I wonder, could we um, open up the windows maybe and uh, maybe the, 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 the ACs are probably so turned off. So it, yeah, for the noise and it, that's what's uh, making it warm. Do you have another question, Mark? You yes, I do. Uh, no. Don and Mark have touched on this, but I'd like to hear from them more specifically and expanding no. on why they think new, new owners uh, should serve on the board. And I, you guys probably need to come up here because now the ACs are turned on. I'm just like to make one comment on assessments and, and going a little bit back to where I started, where I got the, the tail pinned on the dawn of the morning for the board. Down in Gamble, I started um, the conversation earlier in the summer with a number of my, my neighbors. I mean, you should serve on the board. No, you should serve on the board. I got in that tail after that. So, so that, and that's very simplistic. And it's not why I'm right. We do, I do believe that every pod or every uh, gamble, pine cone, lodge, and I can all I have left to think of on the board. Every life is better. The Senate didn't know that being the case. Um, so Which I do, we, we do have that for them. But you won't when you leave. Uh, it depends on who gets voted. No, no. Well, that's why I'm running. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I get it. But um, one of the uh, top three things that I've been told over, and I've talked to a lot of people in the past five or six years, is where do these percentages come from? And, and I think at least the members, and this goes back to where I say transparency, the members need to know at least where the percentages come from. They might not like where the percentages come from. But at least then they'll have an answer to where the percentages come from. And, uh, and Those percentages, there, there is actually a formula that's been in place for but no one even know how long. But no one knows that. No, it's been shared well, more times than I can count. <laughs> I got a copy of it. Is it on the website where someone can go out and look at it? Is it, it is. Is it on the website, Karen? It's, it's, it's the old, are the old declarations there? I don't think there, the old declaration. No, newest declaration. We can share it again. Again, yeah. we got a lot of new owners, so I get the question, and that's yeah. that's a fair question. But again, it has been addressed many, many times in the past, and we're and we're very back. transparent. If I may, wow. it, if I may. Let the old the old assessments were the, the original assessments were based on a convoluted formula that, as Jerry suggested, involved square footage and and fixed fees for each unit. But it also brought into play market value and rentability because Tamaran was originally built as a resort property. And so as the years went on, that formula, and it was put in what we affectionately called the binder, <laughs> and it was kept in the and it was kept in the uh, in the office, and people could look at it because when we changed our declarations back in 2007, 8, 9, whatever it was, that went away. And that the, the, that language in the declarations went away and it just referred, referred to the binder. When then over the years then, that binder came under scrutiny and because of its ambiguous treatment of these different factors. And it was then why John and I got together and we put together a formula that codified and duplicated what was in those, but it, it put it in a formula that anybody could look at. And that is in today's declarations. And that's where we stand. Well, but the key point is the ownership voted 
every owner in this property right. had a chance to express their opinion, That's, Mark, and the vast majority of them voted for the that language that we have today. Six and two thirds percent. And, and again, we, we're, we're absolutely, absolutely open to being transparent. It's I've never been, it, it has always been a question of any. There's a bunch of people that just don't understand. Now, let, let me answer your question. Why bring an e-guide into the field? So first of all, as I said earlier, um, I've served on the board before. I bring my basic principles. I share my priorities. And the third thing is, does the new guy come into the board have the aptitude to take on the projects? And and any way that you define the various things that we're looking through, the water issue, whether it be maintenance issue, whether it be plumbing, whether it be landscape, but projects. And does the person coming in this new have the aptitude to take on the project? You need to, I can't answer, I won't speak for myself. I think I do, but I'm only one person. Everybody's got to make that judgment. As a general proposition, any organization goes stale if you don't bring in the people. If you look at any corporation, any, you know, any board that I've dealt with, people move on. Um, otherwise, you go still. Corporations, they bring in new board members. Can you imagine if you work for a company and you never brought in new employees? How about new employees don't know stories when they're coming in? Like if they hire them, judge them when you hire them, what do they have to do? Bring in and they learn that and they bring new contributions to the organization and you can do it in the So, in general, that is why you bring in new person. Bringing the blood, bringing the ideas to keep the organization back. Okay. Thanks, Don. You want to add something? Um, basically, he had it more at the end of his speech. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've worked in the corporate world for one company for 32 years. And he's right, you bring in new people. Yeah, they don't know anything. You train them. They have good ideas. They, they, they come with a different background. They come with new technology. They come with so. So they teach the old as well as we teach them in order for the company to continue. We don't always hire from within. We pull people in from outside, right? Because if you don't, it does get to go. You have to keep some rotation going in between. You can't. You can't have the same seven, eight, nine people continually rotate in and out of the board because nothing will ever change. Yes, you will still go on, go on with the construction and that type of thing, but you don't look at what's changing out there. For the new people coming in. I think we could get a whole lot more younger people coming in here with some changes. And by we started to this last year, getting a few younger people in. But unless we have change, it's just not going to happen. And this place is just going to close just like any other company does. Fair point. And, and just so everybody knows, we're stepping down because we're term limited on. So there is a structure in place so that people can run. But how long do you have to be off? Yeah. Yeah. So you rotate the same seven, eight people through. That's not true at all. It's totally true. I'm uh, pretty sure if you look at the past and we see how many people have yeah, been there, it's probably pretty. Yeah. Boyd, Boyd's been off for three years. Yeah. And he was he, new. And he said, they were Kathy's on. She was new. We, I was new at one point. There is a process for it. And I'm not, believe me, I agree with all your points. The new blood is great. I totally agree. So I just, all I was trying to point out is that we do have a structure in place. Isn't that why we have elections? That's why we have elections. We we raise our hand every year and say, if you want to run for the board, do it. Decide who they so. want. Another interesting thing is we're having this conversation after 170 people have already <coughs> instead of sending a piece of paper in with here's my background. See what I'm saying? So now we're having a conversation with Don, tell us why you want to be on this board. Right? 170 people have already voted. What is this doing? And how many people don't vote? You, you've had the opportunity. Everybody has an opportunity to submit a resume. If we want to change that process. We can do it. No, I said that's we, the way did, we, we did submit a resume. Right. But that all people are getting is this piece of information. I mean, to me, sometime before there should be a meeting so that we have the Q&A. Not the day they're voting. Or the day mm -hmm. they're voting. Well, we can definitely talk voting. about doing it. So I'm just, just going to throw no. that out there. <laughs> And I did a thing. Yes, I just would like to make one comment to his question why we need new board members. Um, 
there have been several instances with several people that when they've approached the board, they have someone has commented, there's no way that will ever be approved, period. It's not researched. No one, it, it, and you feel like no one's listening. That's what's so frustrating is you should never get a comment from a board member. This will never be approved. Keep in mind, we have board meetings. We have discussions around this. Suggestions are considered in those meetings. Again, we're not, we, we are trying to be as open as we can. We have a lot of new owners and new suggestions are great. So a lot of the changes that we've done in the last several years are because of input from owners. So don't, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to feel like we don't listen because that's certainly not the case. But with that comment, that's what you feel like. And well, I, I can't speak to the comment. It. Nobody approached me, so I can't speak to that comment. Jerry, did you want to add something before we? Jerry, we, did you have a question? Um, I couldn't see if you had a poll. So. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to make one comment um, about uh, staleness of the board. And that is, first of all, you addressed one of those things, which is that there are mechanisms in place for term limits and uh, for people, new people to come on board. In fact, of the board, current board members, I think probably a few um, who have served previously on the board, uh, the rest of them is the first time on the board. The other thing is that um, I, I would say that uh, for people who have been here for a long time, owners for a long time, if you look at where the association was 10 years ago and the problems that the association is faced on, and if you look at where we are today, there has been tremendous, tremendous progress and turned this place around. Uh, very, very significantly, very significantly. So, sure, I would agree uh, with you um, that if the board were uh, not doing anything, letting the place be on hell, then that I would, I would vote them out um, and bring in yeah. new folks. But I, in my opinion, being very heavily involved in, in the association of business boards. The board has been doing an outstanding job, and I cannot fault them. Yeah, just the other thing I would point out again, we got new candidates coming in this year who, who, who want to run for the board. Last year, we didn't have any, it was un uncontested. So, it was COVID. That, that's what she has. Sorry, that didn't Frank. stop anybody running. <laughs> this for retirement. <laughs> okay, again, I'm, not, I'm just pointing out that it's not like the opportunity is not there. So um, if this is a volunteer gig. If anybody thinks it's a glorious job, hmm. uh, I would, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so again, I appreciate the candidates speaking up. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, unless anybody objects, just move straight into the board meeting. Anybody I good? Five minute break, you know, rest room. <laughs> we wanna take a five minute break again. Why don't we just say we'll get started at 9.30? I said nine-ish. <laughs> <laughs> At least we didn't get to ten. I bought yeah. it. Yeah. I don't. Okay, guys, we started recording, so let's get this rolling, please. Have you ever seen the movie Two for the Money? Who's the guy? Yeah, Matthew McConaughey and uh, Al Pacino. Okay, um, I'm assuming we'll have some other people come back. I don't know, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, it is 9.32, so I'm calling the meeting to order. Got that, Secretary? Okay. Um, I want to, I mean, you want to establish the forum? Yeah, the I meeting. think private. <clears throat> order of business should be to uh, for the secretary to confirm that this meeting was properly noticed and that there is a quorum present. We have actually I'm in, in the room, four with Rick, five in the room, and two, I believe, on some sort of electronic connection. Is that a true statement? Yeah, Boyd's on the phone. Ron's up there. Ron's up there. Very Good. Um, and so, having said that, I will also um, call the board's attention. 
to the minutes that have been the minutes of the May 28th meeting that have been distributed to all of you. And hopefully you've had the time to review them. Um, and would, I would like to uh, ask the board to approve these with one change on the second page on the back side of that. Um, I made a reference to attachment two. Uh, and yet, as I understand it, there actually was no attachment. No. There was no paper document of, of the um, property report. It was simply an oral report. That's correct. So if the board would simply line out attachment two, and I would ask somebody, or Mr. President, I would ask the board to approve these with that. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Without one amendment, without one amendment, second. All in favor? Any discussion first, I guess? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Boyd? Ron? Aye. Which, by the way, I do have Ron's proxy just in the event that he has to draw. Um, okay. So minutes are um, submitted. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the one thing I wanted to, well, a couple of things. So um, as I said earlier, for those of you that may not have been here in the early stages, um, uh, this is my last official board meeting to, uh, to chair uh, or to run, I should say, as president. So um, as everybody knows, we um, try to run through these um, you know, in, in, in an orderly fashion. Um, we do need to talk a little bit about the election. Uh, and we brought it up a little bit earlier, but um, as was mentioned, in case nobody uh, or somebody wasn't in here, um, electronic voting is closed, mail-in voting is closed. If anybody hasn't voted, uh, paper ballots uh, need to be submitted uh, either today or tomorrow before uh, or in our owner's meeting. We'll make a final call for those ballots at the owner's meeting. Owner's meeting starts at 10. Yes. God, that's so late. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can the golf course by <laughs> <laughs> It's in the DCCRs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> However, there's a bit of registration and yeah. ballot yeah. submittal and all that stuff at nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You um, can always adjourn it 10 15. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, any questions about anything relative to tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, we, you know, not only the owners meeting, we have the um, hot dog lunch. And I sent out an email this morning for those of you who haven't seen it. The venue for the hot dog lunch has changed. Usually have it under the port of cachet out front. They have changed it to the north deck here of the lodge. Um, one benefit is we don't have to bring the gas grill down here, but it'll be on the north deck. You can take a look at the new stairs and walkway and all that are back there and mingle under the pines and all that. So um, it won't be there. It will be up there at noon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add one last thing just based on the comments uh, that we received uh, over the last hour and a half or so. Um, keep in mind that you know the board is able to be reached at any time by email, by a phone, all that information is on the website. So any suggestion that we aren't available, um, I would take uh, an issue with because that's certainly not the case. Um, I get emails, I get calls, I answer them, I respond to them. I think the rest of the board does the same. Um, Gary's here all the time, Elise is here all the time, they are sounding boards. Uh, so I'd encourage anybody who has ideas or comments or anything like that, um, you know, we're, we're here to, 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 to hear those and to figure out how we address them. Admittedly, we can't address everything on the fly. It usually happens in a board meeting or a subsequent board meeting, we take those suggestions uh, and we try to handle them in that manner. I did ask Gary to do one thing, uh, while we were on break, and that is to look at the camera on HOA website and see if we can add a suggestion box or something like that. Um, in many cases, I think people are concerned uh, on some, you know saying something uh, and perhaps you know not not wanting to uh, to talk about it publicly. Um, if if any if you guys are open to that, I've asked Gary to, to certainly uh, uh, look and see if we can do something like that on the website. Um, again, you know it's that's. We're, you know, we're a, uh, an association of owners um, and we got a varying degrees of ownership. Uh, I don't know, somebody asked earlier about the percentage. What is it of uh, permanents? We got 80? There's, there's, no, there's Board about, members. I think we, we had to do this yesterday. It's about 59, 60 full-time full -time, units, okay. units, not people, but right. full-time units, around 120 short-term rentals 
about 17 long-term rentals and the rest are all private, what, what we generally call second homes. Okay. And that's 180 or so, whatever. Yeah, so whatever adds up to 370. Yeah, there's definitely been a change in ownership. We recognize that. Um, the, um, I don't even know how many damn units have been sold in the last 24 months, but it's <laughs> a boatload. Close to 100. Yeah, close to 100. So, um, you know, we recognize that there's new owners, and, and as new owners, some people don't have the history. And, um, you know, they walk around property, uh, they read the rules and regs, uh, they feel like, you know, things aren't being followed. We get all that. Uh, the reality is, we're not the police. Right, we, we we can't monitor everything. So if you're seeing things or you have suggestions, we're open to them. And I, you know, I, again, I'd encourage um, Gary to, to dig into that so that we can have some kind of suggestion box. Because again, it's we all got to live here. We all got to get along. We all got to figure out how to make the property better. Um, I do want to thank Jerry for his comments. We've come one hell of a long way. How many people here were owners in 2013 and 14? How many people enjoyed board meetings in 2013? <laughs> Rod, you are a sick man. <laughs> Especially if you had to run them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, they, they, they weren't great. So we, we've come a long way, um, both property wise, um, you know, ownership uh, involvement wise, I, I, I think um, can always improve. So anyway, that's my soapbox. I'm going to stop. And that's the last probably soapbox you got to hear for me anyway. Um, Let's move to financials. Okay, um, Gary, do you have you know, financial reports? To yeah, somewhere. Did, Lisa, did you make copies for the board members? The board has, uh, yeah. Do they all have them? Kathy does. Okay. We'll fix that. So, in the interest of not killing trees, we reduced the number of copies of these financial reports that we've made to just the board. Um, everybody else can see them up there on the screen. If you want a copy for your own education, please just ask Elisa and she'll email you a copy. Uh, this report is through August of this year. That's the latest fully compiled information that we have. And if you look at the, this is the balance sheet, top half. I really, really hate to use the term flush with cash, but we're flush with cash. Um, can everybody see it? Does that need to be angled better? It can't angle it. Anymore. It's that's as far as it goes. Um, so we have, we have, uh, Liquid cash in the bank, we have close to close to five hundred thousand dollars. We've got seven hundred and fifty-four thousand seven hundred and thirty-one dollars in our three reserve accounts, 103, 107, and 108. 103 is the local bank San Juan, uh, Bank of the San Juans. That's a money market account. The 107 and 108 are both. Uh, banks, you know, internet banks that we have. Uh, actually, Stearns is a brick and a brick and mortar bank, but it's also an internet internet bank. Uh, First Bank of Indiana is is internet only, and we have laddered CDs with those two two institutions. Uh, that was a good thing a few years ago, but uh, since interest rates, we had interest rates as high as three percent on our on our uh, long term CDs, but now, as they're renewing, they're in the sub 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 half a percent range, and and it's just that's just what the market is. Um, the Fed Fed warns that inflation's going up, so that may change. So there's a silver lining on that cloud if, if it happens. Uh, accounts receivable uh, accounts one one thirty two, one forty, and one thirty three. Lisa, this is probably as low as it's ever been, right? It, yes. Yeah. We've never seen it this low. And this is reflective of, as I get into some other uh, parts of this report, this is reflective of we are very, the economy is good, people are paying their dues, and we have very, very few delinquencies right now. I think we're down to only one that's a, what I would call a problem delinquency. Um, Fixed assets, just to comment on that, that's that that 
reflects that number, you, you want, you, you'd say to yourself, well, if market values are up, why isn't that number going up? Well, that's based on cost, that's cost basis, and then, and then depreciation, it doesn't reflect market value, nor should it. Um, a lot of people always ask me, what is account 240 deferred revenue? So I'll explain it again. Uh, this, this, this number at the first part of every quarter or at the point where our quarterly assessments are filled, this number will swell to about $600,000. And that re represents three, quarter, three months worth of assessments. As the months go by, that decrements down. And we're, that now reflects one month being September because that's the last last month of the quarter and that's we're reporting on august as of august 31st so we still have september's deferred revenue in there be counted for next next month all right move on to the income statement gary uh, you need to come is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, so assessment for, or, I'm sorry, account 400 assessment fees, that's, that's, what, that's the account that collects the money that you pay in assessments and you dues right on budget as it should be. Um, maintenance revenues are down a little bit. Um, we, this, these, this number is pretty much based on historical trends. You know, how much money are we, are we garnering from, uh, from owners who have the maintenance department do work in their units? Um, it's below budget. I guess this is just something we're gonna have to look at when we budget next month and uh, probably bring that number down some because the trend is lower. I don't know whether people are using outside sources to do their maintenance and repairs or, or what, but it is what it is. Uh, Service and collection fees is well below budget. Um, that reflects, again, fewer delinquencies. Those are late fees and interest that we would charge when, when folks who are late, are late or don't pay their assessments. And as I indicated, we're not seeing much of that. So that, that number's down and that's a good thing. Uh, transfer fees are up. This reflects the enormous number of units that are being sold that are changing hands. Um, as you know, you put something on the market here and it's under contract within a week, if not days. Um, pretty much everything else there is in good shape. Um, coming down toward coming down to admin expenses, our insurance is a little over budget. I need to talk to our agent about that. I'm not sure I can explain why that's 3,000 over. It should be pretty much right on. Um, accounting. This is, this is the account that uh, we, where we pay uh, uh, Tommy uh, uh, Meadows and his firm, our CPA. And we're pretty much down to just having them do our taxes and maybe doing a one year, an annual review of our, of our uh, financial reports. Bear in mind, and don't, you know, you might want to say, well, why, why don't you have that oversight? Bear in mind that we still have an auditor, a third-party auditor that does our that audits our books every year. So that's covered as well there. Um, this, the reason that number is way down is because last year we brought Elisa in-house and she's now doing our, doing all of our bookkeeping and accounting, banking, payables, receivables, pretty much everything that was done when she was working for Elliott Meadows. Um, 508, uh, this is where we have, would have write-offs for uncollectible fees. We've had none, we don't expect any. Uh, legal fees are down or below budget. That's always a good thing. And this is also reflective of having fewer delinquencies to deal with filing of liens, foreclosures, things like that. Director's expense will catch up when these last two board meetings this month, people doing traveling, they get their oh, travels in. Let's see what else is sticking out. 
web services will catch up when our know, renewal update online services. Payroll processing is a little over budget. We've been doing this. Is, this also collects background checks when we do re when we do new hires. So there's quite a bit of that in there. We hired some. We hired a number of new employees this year. Uh, let's see. Salaries. This is our admin salaries. Elisa and Gary. And that'll all catch up like, towards the end of the year when we give them bonuses. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> First thing that piqued my interest. In yeah, that. right. Finally, <laughs> something we care about, right, Gary? Let me wake Gary up. <laughs> uh, let's go down to operations. Building maintenance is, again, this is below budget as well. I had a conversation with. Tim on this over the last couple of days. And this is another one where we base this on historical trends. Um, I don't know, maybe this is reflective of how well the maintenance department is doing, keeping the place up to date, things we've done, renewed some things over the last many years. And, you know, maybe our ongoing maintenance charges costs are going to be, are, be, are going to be less going forward. So we, we'll be looking at that when we budget. Um, Snow removal, we're right on. That's a different different thing this year. I mean, we get some good snow this year. This uh, December, we'll probably bring that right up on budget. Um, roof repairs, grounds, window washing, everything else pretty much right there. Uh, I ran into uh, Bo Griswold, who does our, he's the contractor that does our Exterior maintenance, all the painting touch up, staining touch up. He's finished with High Point and he's working on Gamble Oak this week. Uh, he'll be finishing up with that when he, when he, he'll be finishing up all three other areas Gamble Oak, High Point, and I mean, I'm sorry, Gamble Oak, Pine Point, and Pine Cone in the Lodge over the next couple of weeks. Snow flies. And all of those numbers will be right up on in the budgets. <clears throat> Elevator maintenance. You're keeping up with it as well, Gary. Thanks. Um, that's a little over budget. Um, not sure I have an explanation for that, Tim. Do you know, you know why that is? Uh, the first couple months after we got the elevator put into place last November in the South elevator, uh, there was a service agreement that took us about three months to understand and implement. I remember that one. Yeah, we had a we had to pay. Is that clear? Is that finalized, cleared up yeah, now? Done. Okay. And I think we were under budget last year because of that. So it kind of offsets. All right. Um, 652 is over budget. Um, and that's just because we paid our IT services contract. So that'll level out as the year, as we come to the year end. Uh, 656 shouldn't be energy monitoring alarms. We need to change this at least. It should be temperature monitoring alarms. We don't do any energy monitoring. So, and Tim tells me we just bought a whole bunch of new smoke detectors. So that number is going to come up some. Not sure if it'll actually reach budget, but it's not in bad shape either. Um, Fogged window, windows, we went over on this one a little bit this year to accommodate, was it one or two owners, Gary, that, you know, just one owner that requested that he be moved up on the list and get his windows done this year because they were pretty bad. So we did that. Other than that, everything looks good there. Uh, personnel expenses, 600 account, 600 got one in, uh, account that's that's all of our uh, maintenance and ground staff a uh, little bit under budget there and that's because we've been short on ground staff all summer it's been hard to hire people hard to keep people hopefully hopefully with the uh, 
unemployment thing coming to an end this month and next year we'll be able to staff up properly and do a little better on the grounds. Um, utilities, uh, water and sewer, um, that's, that's going to come in slightly under budget this year. Uh, as he was mentioned, Jerry was mentioned, we were, and there's going to be a report on water and sewer, <coughs> sewer later in the, uh, in the meeting, I believe. Yes. <coughs> um, we've got this contract coming to an end. We've withheld some, we've withheld some money from our bills. And uh, so I believe, I believe this, when we get that agreement done, uh, some of the concessions that the water company is making uh, that we hope will stay in place will we'll be well under budget on the, on, the, uh, on the water and sewer. Satellite TV is right on. Electricity, not sure what's going on there. This has always been a hard target to hit. Um, we may be spending more on electricity this year. It's been a warmer summer. Maybe we're running the air conditioners in the lodge a little more. Um, we've had higher occupancy. Maybe that translates to a little more energy use. Uh, this is another one we're going to have to look at the budget when we do it next month and see, see how we adjust. Internet's right on. And... Uh, what? I'm sorry, just on electricity, as far as we know, it's not a rate issue, it's a consumption I, issue. I questioned rates and I, I don't know, I haven't seen any evidence of a high of a, of a rate increase. And have we seen, when you look at the bill, when we look at the yeah. bills, do we? Last budget season, I confirmed what the rates are going to be through 2021. Right. It has to be consumption. We look at that every year when we budget. And yeah, well, we've had a much heavier rental season when we've had historically the set records. So you got the properties that have been vacant in the past that aren't vacant. Yeah. And I mean again, this electricity is common area electricity. It's not electricity inside the units. Right. And, but that's still so people. Yeah, it's still people and they're you know it's, Joe, a, it's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. One one thing I noticed this summer right, is that they be keeping the doors open at the lodge, at the main entrance of the lodge. Yeah. And it's like 95 degrees out. The doors are wide open up there. So that's probably sucking up a lot of electricity right there. That could be. Yeah. Um, could also be the restaurant. We didn't have a restaurant a year ago. Well, the restaurant's paying its own electricity. Okay. So it's not in this. Okay. okay. Well, it is, but yeah, it, it is. is, but then it gets offset when they pay. So there's an offset somewhere, but it could very well be part are of the increase then. Are they up to date on their electricity what payments? Yeah. That was a problem in the past with other restaurateurs, but I haven't heard anything that they're not paying the bills. But it's like five, six hundred bucks a month. But they're current. And it's on our bill. I don't know when the revenue shows up. So well, the revenue should off, there, the revenue does offset. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's not that's good. So it's not that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, refuse service is over budget. Um, this summer, we because of the high occupancy, we saw big problems with the dumpsters at both Pinecone and High Point with uh, overflowing. We actually added a recycle bin. You added a recycle bin. Yeah. And we also bumped the capacity on High Point, Pinecone, from, right. from four to eight. Yeah. So we've got bigger dumpsters in both High Point and, and uh, Pinecone. Yep. But um, so we're looking good on the bottom line. We're 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 under budget overall on expenses uh, and net. So we're in, we're in really good shape. Uh, let's go to capital, Gary. So there's a lot of items here that are that are under budget, um, and a lot of these capital project items get covered either in the summer or in the fall when it quiets down. Tim's going to cover a whole lot of these uh, when he when he does his property report. Um, so I let me see what can I try. 801, for example, 801 improvements to landscaping. Um, it looks like we might have over under over budgeted that, but we didn't. 
we under-executed. There's, and, and again, Tim's gonna talk about this. It's, it's, it's labor issues and so forth. And I'll let, I'm, rather than walk on him, I'll let him, I'll let him report on all this when he, when he gets his, uh, his deal going. Um, same thing with the landscape irrigation upgrades, uh, renovation of the maintenance office, that's done. So we, we, we reduce scope, um, so we save money there. The storage lockers and cages on the second floor, expanding our ability to offer storage to owners, that's done, that came in under budget. Uh, the bat mitigation, uh, Tim tells me we will spend that. I'll let him talk about it. Um, the rear deck railings and Gamble Oak, we'll do that. That'll get done. We had a scope reduction in the remodel of the office area, with how that was all going to lay out where, where uh, Gary and Elisa are now that was gonna be a different layout and it was decided to change that so it costs less, that's finished. This 815 landscaping for Glacier Agreement, this was something we, it was tied into the 2017 agreement we have with Glacier regarding the, the lease on the pool and fitness that we gave up and the memberships that you're all enjoying now, for most of you anyway. Um, there was supposed to be some landscape work done. It was never done. We took it out of the budget. We put it back in this year as a place mark because we expected possibly to do something with that. And now we've made some agreements with Glacier on some, <clears throat> on some property signage. And so that'll that 815 will go away when we do our budget for next year. Security cameras, uh, we put in quite a few more security cameras than we anticipated. So we spent more money on that. I did notice on, on your, on the, was it on the website or on a communication where we're gonna get, oh, it was in the, in the newsletter. We're gonna be able to now look online and see all four areas. With, with webcams. Yeah. Nice. Well, yeah, so you're going to give an update on that. Right? Okay. Yeah. So Tim will talk about that too. Are those the, the cameras for like just around here or is that the one? In the parking there? lots. Okay. And here. Well, I mean, I, we, I had read that, you know, like people could ask for cameras to be pointed towards their door. That's a different That's a different subject. subject. Yeah. Yeah, we had talked last year in yeah. one of the board meetings about um, giving owners the ability to, you know, is the snow falling? You know, what That's do the there. parking lots look like? Gary sends out a nasty grandma not looking in your cars, you know, is my car there? So, you know, those kind of things that just, and, and a security, that was the other thing. Yeah. Uh, 817, um, the lodge drain plumbing refurbishment project, Tim's gonna report on that. And the signage, um, we'll finish up that budget here when we, uh, apparently when we do the, one out in the parking lot, a new one, get the, get the letter in there. <clears throat> uh, improve the north area of the lodge. I think we've got, uh, it, it, I signed the check for the railings. That was, that's not included in here, right? That's, that's that was September. That was right, September, yeah. right. So that number will come up a little bit and that'll probably be very close to budget when it's done. Um, unplanned capital expenses. We've always, for the last several years, we've put in $25,000 and some years we're under, some years we're over. This year we're way over. And that's because of the heat take project that Tim discovered that, um, that we were way under standards as far as the heat tapes under the buildings. Uh, this is primarily in pine cone and gantelope, right? Yeah. yeah. This is to keep the drains from freezing. <clears throat> the electrical circuits weren't protected like they should have been. Potential fire hazard. Tim recognized this, and it's all been fixed. Cost a bit of money, but it's we're a lot we're a lot safer than we were before. So that's that was the issue there. 
And um, other than that, again, bottom line, when this is all said and done, we'll be in pretty good shape. As I said, there's a number of items here that we were under budget on and we won't spend it. So that probably offsets the, uh, the overspending we did on the, on the plan. Um, reserves. Um, as you can see, our interest income is well under budget. As I explained, our CDs aren't, as they roll over, they're not getting, they're not getting the interest rate that we thought. So we'll be adjusting that budget downward uh, for next year. Uh, unit rental revenue. This is units 110, 114. They're both owned by the association. Uh, they're rented long-term. Uh, one to an employee and another one to just a, an outside person. This also includes unit 228, which we rent from the owner and then we sublet to a to an employee and we actually make some money on that. Um, so all that all that revenue is included in there and that's why it's it's a bit over budget. So we're, that's a good thing. We're making we're making more money than we thought we were on those rentals. Question on the so we have a question. Question. Yeah, I understand the one being louder. I said I understand the one being rented to an employee, which is a good thing to get people here. Um, but the way they're selling. This is something I was planning to bring up with the board, and we'll probably do it in executive session. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. It. yeah. I. Good point, and in, and it's wrong. It. Problem we didn't have before this year. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I mean, it's, I mean, you're absolutely right. 110, we paid 80,000 for it to get a bad owner out of here. And that, that's, there's money on the table there. And the owner's still there. <laughs> Never coming back. Um, anyway, uh, looking, we'll be looking good uh, at, at uh, year end for the, uh, for the reserves, by year end, we should be up over eight hundred thousand dollars in reserves. So looking good. Uh, last item is the uh, we do a separate income statement for the service and security desk, the front desk. Um, this this is where we collect all of the uh, the fees, the admin fees, uh, the rent resort fees that are charged for the for rentals. Um, that's over budget and that's reflective of higher occupancy. So that's looking very good. Um, the expenses are a little bit under budget. So that that account is is in the is in the black and looking very good. And that's it. Any questions from the board? Way up. TP, uh, TP. Which category does the salary we're paying you for a position that used to be a volunteer board position? Uh, Where do you fall in? It's, in, it's in uh, uh, administrative expenses, auditing, and consulting fees. That also includes the auditor that yeah. Todd Beck said will do a presentation tomorrow for the, the annual audit of. And for your information, that salary goes away at the end of this year. I'm sorry. And I said, for your information, that salary goes away at the end of the year. I'm going back to being a volunteer if, if Rick wants me to. <laughs> or the rest of the board. I'm sorry. Or the rest of the board. Yeah. 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 Just for background, so everybody yeah. understands where I that understand. came from. Um, when um, was it three years ago? Three. Years ago. Three. Yeah. Um, when uh, we were going through a transition, Joe was stepping down from the board. We realized we had a, a, a lack of knowledge and some gaps we needed to fill until we could figure out how to transition uh, the accounting functions, uh, uh, you know, either to a new board member uh, or elsewhere. And um, when we hired Lisa, we said, "Okay, this is this, this is our solution, but we need Joe to to stick on to to work with Lisa to get her up to speed." So, so the end of this year, that goes away. Lisa takes over. Did you have a question? Yeah, what, what was decided on the C show uh, where we're going to play the fact 
flat fee or we're just going to get you a snowmobile because <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one who uses the damn thing. <laughs> used it the last few years. Is your three question years. relate to 2021 or 2022? What your sweet your ski question? What are we going to do for well, next year? Because, or because the uh, it said that they had offered us like a five thousand dollars flat fee and then not paying that seven fifty or so. Was did you find out they listened? We yeah. negotiated and said. Yeah, it's I can't on that. We did finalize the agreement. The it's going up next year. It went up, uh, and they were going to cut down on the days. We expanded the number of days to include high season. Uh, I can share the copy of the agreement with anybody. It's, it's going up to 5,000. I don't have enough yeah. Yeah. It's going up to 5,000, and then it's still going to have limited time, but I think we've got some language in there that protects us in case in, in like Christmas season and yeah. President's Weekend. Uh, spring break spring break where where they might need more shuttles so we you know, it's the best we can do i mean it's yeah but we're not gonna have to sit there and we don't have count a, for every person that rides it that, that must have been a nightmare doing that yeah you just pay them the five thousand it's just a flat fee now so we don't do it yeah. so that's but you still have to here. you still have to reserve yeah because there's a cap on how many riders there can be on a day yeah. <clears throat> any other questions there's some questions up there, Gary. Um, I believe we have we have had conversations about owners needing to use for short term the oversized parking space is not provided. In the past, the owners have been able to park their RV on property for no more than 48 hours coming and going. Do we as owners need now to pay for the use of oversized spaces for that 24 to 48 hours? This is a board decision. Is this a board decision or operation staff decision? That's not a question for me. Um, um, and then there's a question uh, I missed who's providing the budget review. That's Joe Carey, um, board treasurer. So, Jim, you may need to chime in here because I don't remember the exact details of the of the uh, oversized parking. Yeah. We you. charge a uh, a fee, and there's how many spaces? Nine. Nine. And the transitional, what they're talking about is less than 48 hours for an owner. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So that didn't change. That, that didn't, didn't change. change. An owner yeah. can come in and they have a couple of days to park what they need to park to get the furniture and equipment in and out of the gym. Okay. That is not, that is, they do not require an oversized parking spot for that activity. But that's only in those RV, spots, that RV. only in those spots where they can park in front of their unit. I think that, very correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the rule says that they can park. In close proximity to their unit for unloading and loading purposes for two days, correct? Yes, and that used to be 24 max. hours. When did that change? I don't think it used to be 24 hours. When did it go? I believe it was 48 hours. This was a year or two or three ago. Two ago, okay. yeah, it could change. The, the problem that we have is somebody parks their RV in front of the unit, and then you don't see any activity there for. 36 of those 48 hours. Well, they're not loading and unloading. You know, and that's that becomes a problem. Or they park in the, the, the oversized parking areas and other people want to use it. This is a problem most of the summer. Um, and they're not loading and unloading. You know, it's it's a policing issue that is a huge headache. But was that the question? I thought the question was can they park their RV there for 24 48 hours? It, it, said RV. it did say RV. It did say RV. And well, yes, that's because they're, they're, no, they're traveling in their RV to get here. Well, it, it, that wasn't specific on what it said. It said, can they park their RV for 24 to 48 hours? I think what we're saying is we would treat that, and correct me if I've got this wrong, but we would treat that like we would treat a, you know, a trailer policy or anything else, where if you're loading and unloading, you can do it for 24 to 48 hours, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. If they're if they're just coming here in their RV, they're going to stay in their RV, or ju they're just going to park it. No, they can't. They can't just leave it. There. They can't just be left there. It's unattended. Cool. Cool. How do you enforce yeah. that? Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah, and all, all, all we can do is, if, if we have an issue, somebody needs to report it, and we'll try to contact the owner. I mean, first of all, I don't know. Just may sound crass, but why the hell aren't they staying in their unit? <laughs> no, I think, I think they're probably just driving here in your No, home. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's going to be from the next year. <clears throat> they're leveling 
you know, I'm, I'm seeing them leveling their units. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to level it. So the kids yeah. are still being somebody's still being. Yeah. Yeah. And if Again, you I'm not here all the time. Let us know. Then. Yeah, because we don't. Is we that, wouldn't see the leveling, there, but that's that, is there, that's is there great information. Prohibition of staying in an RV. Yes. Yes. We talked about that. We talked about that last board meeting. Yeah. yeah. So so it's. It's not temporary park and occupied. Yeah, it's yeah. only park. It's, it's not, not intended temporary. to be overflow for family. We're not Walmart. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I've noticed that the ones in Pine Cone, no, non display of the hang tags. Are they, are, are folks being told that they need to, that tank, that yellow green tag needs to be visible? I believe they're being told. I don't see those people, but I believe. They're being there told was, that they have to hang one, but the, the question is, you know, if it if it's a trailer, where do you put the hang tag on? Which trailer? window? Well, tape you know, is, tape it to a window. The hitch. The, the yeah, hitch anywhere. Hitch or, so some people anywhere. are detaching and then we're putting it on their truck window, window and the trucks park somewhere no. else. Yeah, so right. There's a confusion yeah. there. There yeah. were three. There were two razor trailers and that big white where Ron is today in the last week. And the whole week they were there, and I never saw a hang tag. Right, on and any of them. we do have, have it right now leveled out. Yeah, so yeah, we have a reservation. Ron's, Ron's, yeah. And Ron has paid his his fees, He's so we paying. have a reservation. Well, you will be billing. Correct. Yeah. Correct. You haven't paid it yet. <laughs> we have a reservation system. If you guys see Ron a trailer here. in a parking reserved parking spot, you're welcome to call front desk and ask if who is this? Are they? Did they pay? Is this legal? And we we would like to know too. We try to keep an eye on it, but. A couple of weeks ago, we had an RV park, I think it was in Gamble, in a parking spot. And they were living in it with the generator on 24 hours a day. With the generator? No. I mean, no. That needs to be reported. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take a picture and send it in. Tell yeah. us. Well, Mark. But, you know, we have maintenance people, we have Gary, everybody drives by this every day. Why put it back on us? It, it's, well, because we're, we're, we're all community. owners. We, we all own this. Yeah, if you have an issue, you got to bring it up. I mean, we're not going to read mine. We do get a lot from Taryn. She does help us. You if know, you see it as a father, stuff. make a phone call. Easy. All right, Mark. Um, and again, we're talking about the ten dollar a day slots, not one of those mixed back there. As um, TP said, there was a generator. Gary may have heard it because it's right outside of the unit. That was chugging away. I never heard a generator. It's the first I'm hearing about. Well, yeah. There's a generator and a big RV chugging away for at least a week. Yeah. Into the wee hours of the morning? 24 hours well, of that. At least till 10 o'clock. That's when I walk my two dogs. Again, but, I mean, you've got to tell us. I, in my read of the rules, I think it's unclear whether people are allowed to stay in their $10 a night unit or not. I think the rules are hard to make it crystal clear that they are not. We can certainly modify it. I agree. And, and, and I think that solves the problem. I mean, keep in mind, we just put this policy in place with relative to the oversized vehicles and all of that, what, last board meeting? Yes. So, well, you know, yeah. right in the rules to clarify who would be having this discussion. Fair enough. I'd be curious, Mark, where do you, what do you think is uh, fuzzy? Help us understand what words you think are fuzzy, because certainly we intended to exclude exactly what you're talking about. Why don't we do this? Just shelf that for a minute, because we're going to do rules and rates. We'll pull it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to clarify, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a newbie, even though I've owned that trailer a couple of years now. Leveling is key for a lot of reasons other than occupancy. Okay. Secondly, if you don't have adequate solar, some generator runtime may be necessary to pump the batteries up. So when you get to rules and regs, you need to consider a reasonable period of time that generators could be run. But if it's only there 24, 48 hours, is but I'm, I'm talking about long term as well. There's We're in there for two weeks versus 24 hours, two weeks. Okay, so we're there for two weeks. If we did not have solar, our batteries would be dead, our produce would be spoiled, and so forth. I'm just saying these are things that you need to consider. That's a fair point. Yeah. Okay. Well, but, your produce wouldn't it be inside your unit, and doesn't your battery charge as they're pulling it? Just saying. I have to say when it's when it's parked for two weeks, you're not pulling it. <laughs> At least well, I'm not pulling mine. But what am I keeping? Why is my my battery not being used? It should be staying charged. So I'm not. Oh, if I, if Ventilation fans. I, I, I mean, I don't want to get into an argument. I'm just trying to say well, when you do the rules and regs, it needs to be reasonable. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Okay. Scott? Yeah, I would 
also point out um, rules and regs would govern owner use. So, oh, so you're talking about if somebody's a rental? I was going to say the other would be a policy. Rules and regs apply to owners, policies apply to rules and regs apply to anybody in occupancy. Yeah, right. so technically uh, the owner is right. responsible for their renter and complying with the rules and regs. Yes, I agree. Yeah. People who come here and say they are too, I don't think they're provided with our rules and regs. No, but they're subject to. Them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so the owner moves on to, we're done with uh, with financials. So let's begin with the piece of paper. Oh, water and sewer. <laughs> All right. Put myself on the ditch for review. No, wait, I, I skipped out. Okay. Okay. Uh, unit 624, 625, the owner bought it sight unseen. Um, he said the Trex deck on the back is all beat up. He said there's over 100 dents and dings in it. He wants to replace it at his expense. He said he will um, use, a, I forget exactly what company, but he said it will match exactly what is there. And- uh, I'm sorry, did you say siding? The, the Trex decking. Oh, the decking. Yeah, on his on back, back there. there. Yeah, it, it's up in High Point that overlooks the valley. Mm -hmm. What unit? What color is the deck in there? Uh, is it all nice brown? Is it all brown? Yeah. Uh, six forty-three, or excuse me, six twenty-four, six twenty-five. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Said FYI, we use Durango Tech's dealer to install the same color with the proof. Thank you. You might want to I thought we can't hear you. Sorry, we have this silly AC going. I said, you know, we had to replace Tina Sandy last year when we know what we they needed to use to replace it. They have to match it. They, yeah, I mean, they technically are supposed to match. Yeah, you can't, can't, you can't match it. exactly because it's well, well, you'll have product fading. changes over the years yeah. and fading and things yeah. like that. Yeah. My suggestion would be to get a to prove a sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. My mm -hmm. my recommendation on that would be approval subject to uh, color matching approved through Tim. I mean, you might want to go back to the process that was used, like Don said at uh, McGraw's, because that would be the most recent change out of the deck. That thing. I think they had a hard time finding anything. It wasn't an exact match, but it was close. Yeah. 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 The other thing I would emphasize to them, Rick, is this is still a limited common element. They may bought, buy it, pay for it, but they don't own it. They don't own yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick, I'll interject. The, the problem with the deck is that was painted. That that has been painted in the, in the problems with it or with paint peeling off that several people have done that. Paint didn't painting the tracks? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Ours, so then does it really need to replace it? I think uh, talk with him about this. Yeah. yeah. He he just wants to replace it. He wants to replace it. Okay. I don't think we have an issue with it. Like, uh, yeah. No. yeah. It's an improvement to a common <laughs> Audrey Brown. Is that color. the color? Is that it? Audrey Brown. Right, you got that up? Yeah. Uh, Sherman Williams. <clears throat> unit 643, 644. Uh, they have put a loft in their upstairs unit and they want to run an electric conduit up the side of the unit. They're on the end uh, so that they can put air conditioning in the top. The, uh, the loft. In 643, 644. So they already went through art to do the loft. Yeah. And they, they just failed to think about the fact it's going to be hot as hell up there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And yeah. they said they will, if approved, they will paint, pay for painting to match the exact color. And I said, so they're going to put one of these T jacks in? Um, no, they're going to put in what's called a mini split or a split mini, whatever that is. It's going to be outside. And they're going to, they've got to run something that is about the size and shape of a 
rain gutter up the side of the building. On the outside. On the outside. Mm. Where are they going to put the condenser? Uh, that I don't know. Well, that's an exterior mount, too. I believe that's exterior. It's probably going to be underneath the unit, but I don't know. So is there, I mean, that would that would stand out. Obviously, mm -hmm. what, 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 it's a logic. No, it's 640. 640. Okay. It's up in one. So we're, from a visibility perspective, what's, what's backing up for this? Um, it's just, it's next to a unit. Have they submitted plans? They submitted plans, yeah. Okay. Do they have, do they have a county permit for the loft? They're not supposed to be living with lofts. I don't know why they need air conditioning. They're, they're just using it for storage. It's an A&S unit. Um, okay, so then answer my question. Do they have a permit for occupancy up there? I, the I don't know. You're calling a lot. Because every lot where you have a lot. So why are you yeah. calling a lot? No, no, not, not, not necessarily true. Some lofts are for storage only. We, we've had owners redo lofts that are for storage, not for living. And it sounds to me like they're going to live in there, and that's okay as long as they've got a permit from the county to do that. I just don't want us to be a party to some unauthorized violation of county uh, law. Rights, not law, not law. Yeah, I, I, I mean, well, I, I can't but, picture this yeah. in my hand, in my head. So I guess I need we need well, to have some yeah, plans. Not to mention if you're going to let so one person do it, whether it's right. or not, then anybody can do it. Yeah, that's that's why I want to see what it's going to look like, because otherwise we're going to create yeah. it. Mess. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, is there some reason why they can't do it inside the unit? It's more just I, don't, I don't know. I have not spoken to them. I mean, my, my, I mean, number one, we need to shelve it for now. Yeah. yeah. But okay. my yeah, immediate sure. reaction is if they're going to do anything like that, it would have to be the feedback. So it looks the same yeah. as everything else. Um, but we need to get more information on it. Yeah. Because it, right. it may be so, that was one of the units. Um, <clears throat> When originally remodeled, uh, air conditioning was optional when there was not air conditioning put in. Because I don't think that these owners built the lock. If a lock was built, I don't. It's the storms. Right. And I don't think that they. Van Storm. I don't think that they built. Is this the lock. an ASU? Yeah. yeah. Most of those locks were added. At some point in time over the years. Yeah. There was a few originals, but it was yeah. Okay. Um, and then unit 822, uh, the owner just wants to install a window and it faces out into the trees. So there's no issue there. Okay. Just needs to exterior, just needs to match existing windows. So um and then there was another request. An owner wants to put in some type of hanging fireplace that swivels around. And to do that, he would need to run a gas line on the inside up the wall to the ceiling <coughs> hanging down. Um, it's not an exterior thing, but to me, that sounds like a fire hazard. It sounds like a fire hazard. Gary <laughs> showed me this, and I'm trying to envision how this thing has a, a burner down here, which means there's a gas line, and it rotates. Yeah. And is there some kind of a, a rotating gas fitting? I don't know. I, I like, like the sound of that. I'm opposed. <laughs> I'm opposed to anything like that. The we have plenty of fireplace approvals that have precedent that we can address, but yeah, this one sounds a little wonky to me. Yeah. This was originally going to be a, a wood burning fireplace, and I and I talked to them. And said, That's not going to happen. You can't have a wood burning fireplace. But they have a gas version available, and so that's what they were planning to do. What's what's the unit? Where's it at? Uh, Eight thirty-six. This thing looks like a flying saucer on a suspender. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason why they couldn't go with a traditional? I, Think they want the electric the fireplace like we approved doesn't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm I'm it's I'm the aesthetic opposed to it. that goes with the rest of their yeah. green model. It's really you know, modern. modern, it's modern looking. Well, kind of can almost um uh mid-century modern 
you know that because it looks it reminds me of the 70s yeah. kind of funky or 60s <laughs> well, if it is an approved gas fixture the rotating fixture why would you deny it if it is an industry fixture for that gas to rotate why would you deny it i think we need to understand the, the totality of this. If, right. if they were to provide we all the have, specs, then you then you could assess we, it. We, we, we could certainly consider any, but we have set we have many many precedents already in place for fireplace approvals. So I think we need to look at it and understand. I my concern would be you've got a flame hanging from a ceiling, and if that ceiling were to fail, the hook were to fail, then you've got a live flame dropping onto the floor. It's basically, a well, you have a broken gas line too. You have a broken gas yeah. line too. It's a chimney. It, it, it's a how big around is that, Gary? Ten inches. It's about uh, yeah, yeah, and it goes all the way to the ceiling and then up through the, the roof penetration. Okay, because he said hang. Well, it does. It's yeah. the envision envision a ten inch tube. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it goes all the way up through the ceiling, and it hangs at what two feet above the floor, right. and it looks like a, a flying saucer with a. With an opening attached to it and that's where the flame is and so, it can be i don't know if it's continuously rotating or you could just move it 90 degrees i don't know so it's basically you've got a <clears throat> collar up above the roof line that's essentially holding this thing in place yeah no i don't know how much yeah. it so weighs. Say, i don't think we have enough information i don't think we would approve anything like this without talking to well, the insurance company the running the gas line up a wall and over yeah. it, and yeah. there's no place in the ceiling to run a gas line Remember, these yeah. are solid ceilings. It, it would, yeah. I talked to Jeremiah yesterday, he's the contractor that's doing that. And, um, I think they're taking, I think they're gutting that entire floor to ceiling. Yeah, I know, it's but that's, the, but not the ceiling. Not the, ceiling. Yeah. the ceiling is, you have when you the look, wood underneath. In the, any uh, unit in Pine Cone and Gamble Oak, when you look at the ceiling, that's your roof. Yeah. It's six inch tongue and groove. With shingles on top, okay. and you're looking at the bottom of it. There's so, no place to run anything yeah. inside there. Inside. So it'll be an so that's like, that's it. So it'll be an exposed that's pipe, just like your sprinkler system. Okay. How much does that even weigh? Would it suspend something from our structure? I don't know. I'd like to you need an engineering report for that. Yeah. Is that what you're concerned? And keep in mind yeah. that not only is there a gas line coming down the mechanism that's going to cause it to rotate, but there's also the venting that's going to go up the same pipe where the gas is coming down. That also I, doesn't sound real good. <laughs> I, I don't know. And I I would guess that somebody has, some engineer has come up with this and Thanks. they, you know, they feel it's safe, but I, I don't know. All those things are going to be contained. In the, the same same not, we have to understand structurally how it fits into our property. You know, Tim brings up a good point. Again, I, I would be worried about our insurance company approving something like that. So, at any rate, um, okay. so I, I, it's something obviously that you know, you uh, yeah. have the challenge of turning that into a motion. Yeah. Okay. Let me suggest that to be one. And I've got notes for on each one. For I've got oh, okay. notes yeah. on the trex issue. I've got notes the on the installation of the window at eight twenty two. It appears to me your suggestion those are the two items yes. the board yes and you're yes. going to propose yes. yes action i will make a motion that we approve the replacement of the trex deck for unit 624 625 mm -hmm. and the installation of the window in unit 822. let's do one at a time okay uh motion to approve 624 625 placement of the common rear element common element the trex deck for the rear deck. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, yeah. Aye. That's with Tim's blessing on color. Yeah. With Aye. condition upon Tim's approval of the color. Boy, did you approve? I did. Okay. okay. I heard Ron say yes. I yes. And Bill said yes. So. Yeah. 
Second motion. Okay. I make a motion to approve the installation of the window in unit 822 uh, conditioned upon Tim's approval of the matching to existing windows. Did you second? Did you second? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then for units 643, 644, the air conditioning and unit 836, the hanging fireplace. We will defer those until we get more information. Including plans and specs, our conventional review, possible yes. insurance review. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, second. Well, well, hold on. It, it's, it's just, that, that, that does not need to be a yeah. motion. That is simply information. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 OG knows the docs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that does. All right, That's we done with ARC? Yeah. Okay, learn sir. Um, Jerry's still here. All right, so um, the water and sewer um, committee uh, is comprised of Joe, myself, Eric, Jerry, and Greg, um, and Steve and Harris. And our attorney. And our, well, obviously our attorney. Um, and we have been um, at this now since 2013 to a degree, <laughs> but the last year uh, we have very actively been in negotiations with uh, the folks over at ECWC. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the granular detail of everything that we have gone through because we would be here until next Thursday and I will not be in office by then. So <laughs> um, in a nutshell, uh, Glacier uh, had presented a contract to us um, a year plus ago. Uh, we told them no way, not going to do it. Um, uh, we started fervently uh, negotiating with them a um, little over a year ago. And, and, and most of the work that we did uh, in the early stages was, was really Jerry's effort, working very closely with a company called PVC. PVC did all the water modeling um, and was responsible for creating the rates on an annual basis. Uh, we probably dissected that, that rate structure, uh, I don't know, two dozen times try and made tweaks almost every time we went back to them. We had, we received permission directly from Glacier or ECWC, I'm gonna use that interchangeably here. We received permission from, uh, from them to work uh, directly with uh, the folks at BBC. Um, probably something that ECWC regrets doing at this juncture because we did make a lot of changes and we made a lot of corrections. Um, but it was all very positive. We have a great dialogue with the guys from BBC. Um, and uh, many of those adjustments uh, were made. Uh, we then um, worked, started to work through contracts. Um, as Jerry alluded to, uh, when we originally uh, were budgeting or were presented with the, with the amounts, um, it was well over $400,000 annually. I didn't know the number off the top of your head. Four and a quarter was our highest budget yeah. year. Um, and we started working through, uh, through the contract and there were a lot of details in the contract that we worked through, everything from uh, repayment of the debt and, and, and for, for everybody's uh, education, the, the main uh, point that we were discussing was what we, what we referenced as debt service. Um, ECWC uh, has put a lot of uh, infrastructure in place uh, to support the water that we receive uh, and it was debt incurred as a result of that. And they wanted uh, and expected the users of uh, the water, uh, not just us. It's us. It's Rockwood. It's they're all of them. Glacier, Glacier, but the other estates. Yeah. yeah. Village of Rockwood, estates of Rockwood, Rockwood Farview. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we took issue with the uh, with the debt service. Uh, we felt that we had a contract in place that didn't allow them uh, to charge us for debt service. Um, we certainly uh, recognized the infrastructure uh, uh, improvements that were made. And we felt that we could find a compromise uh, in working through the issues that um, uh, relative to, to that debt service. Um, 
so we in those negotiations uh, we uh, convinced or uh, agreed mutually uh, for ECWC offered up to waive and Jerry you can correct me on all these dates when I probably screw them up but um, to waive debt service that was incurred prior to 2018 uh, to the point of 2.667 million plus I don't know two three hundred thousand dollars. Uh, in exchange for that, uh, we agreed uh, in principle uh, to uh, negotiate a, uh, a debt repayment on the improvements that have been made uh, in, you know, since really from 2018 forward. Um, uh, those uh, negotiations have been ongoing uh, literally up until yesterday. Um, we agreed on repayment of the debt uh, at a a 25 year amortization uh, at 6%. And keep in mind, that's not just us, that's all users of ECWC. Um, I'm going out of memory here, Jared, but it was like 4.8 million. What was the total? 5.2. Five, two. Five, two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, long and short, here's where we're at today. Um, uh, we have gone back and uh, made tweaks to the contract. Uh, we got final approval of uh, some of the changes that we requested relative to uh, how the debt was going to be repaid, their application of payments uh, on a regular basis to the debt service, uh, the way the, um, uh, the debt was amortized. Uh, all of that has now been agreed to. Uh, we uh, believe that we have uh, a, uh, a formal agreement that we can mutually uh, agree to sign. Um, we're going to talk about that in executive session and hammer it out. And Mr. Ken Golden just got here. He's our attorney. He's going to help us get to those final stages. Long and short, it's not signed yet, uh, but we believe we've agreed in principle to um, what we think is is is, is uh, fair and equitable. I will also add that one of the, uh, the the things that we asked ECWC to provide is access to uh, to their records and to invoices and to all of the information. Uh, that uh, we were being asked to participate in repaying because we felt we had a fiduciary uh, responsibility and obligation to review and confirm that the debts that they were claiming were in, in fact accurate. Um, we had a team that I think consisted of Eric, Elisa, and Joe. Um, is anybody else involved? The, the two of the audit? Yes. Uh, just the three of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that spent time over at ECWC or Glacier, wherever it was, um, last week, two weeks ago, uh, to uh, validate that the uh, uh, the expenses that we were being asked uh, to uh, repay were, were documented. Um, we've asked and received commitment uh, that we will receive audited financials from them on a go-forward basis. Um, we are confident that uh, the expenses that were incurred uh, are legitimate expenses and documented expenses uh, that will ultimately uh, you know, be confirmed with uh, with, with their uh, final audit. Um, they, their last audit was for 2018, I think, and we're awaiting uh, audited financials for 20, or for 19 and 20. Um, they've had some delays in getting those done, but they anticipate getting those to a short. So, um, Jerry, anything? Uh, not, uh, not significantly. Uh, I will say that the original water and sewer agreement we had was dated in 1989. And it was with the predecessor of the community. You may need um, to speak up a little bit because I don't know if they can hear you. Okay, so yeah, the, the original agreement we were operating under was signed in 1989 with the predecessor uh, to uh, Carlton and Glacier Carlton, basically. Under that agreement, we had the right, Camelot, to review every year uh, their operations and their finances and have direct input in what the rates would be set out in the upcoming. When uh, Carlton uh, bought that portion of the property, uh, he signed an addendum to that agreement, or the board president at that time signed it. And what it did was it, it replaced all of the great business and our ability to challenge it or have a direct input into it to something that we paid, we paid a flat fee both per year. And it started out at $279,000 per year. Uh, built into that was that they, they had the 
option is to raise our rates by 3% every year, which they did almost without fail. <clears throat> That's how we wound up with 418,000. 420. 420,000, something like somewhere, that, yeah. in 2018, until this new Elder Creek uh, water company stood up in 2019. The problem was, and had to be obvious, was that all of the users of the water were paying the same fee per unit, which got up to be about $90 per unit uh, per month, if I remember correctly. <laughs> that meant that we, each of our units, were paying the same amount as the mansions back to the time. <laughs> and they began charging us additionally for irrigation water on top of that. So it doesn't take the rocket scientist to try out to figure out that there was something not very equitable about that. And that's what we dug into. And the first analysis I did was 2016 for a full year with where we metered our usage. We knew how much they produce. Our usage was 10% of, uh, of the water produced. And we were paying about set over 70% so that's what happened. However, because all of the single home owners had this tremendous deal going on where they could irrigate to their hearts content and pay $90 a month, they didn't want to change anything. And Glacier, when we started starting with John and, and Joe and then me leading on them to make some changes, well, guess what? They dragged it and they dragged it and they dragged their feet. But they eventually came around in 2019 to set up this new public Creek water company. And the reasons why they did that. But as part of the process, they, they put in meters. They, they began putting in meters for all of the users so that the rates that people have to pay for the water were predicated not on a flat fee across the board, but on usage. And that was the whole key. It turns out that <laughs> if they had imposed that without doing the upgrades to the infrastructure that they've done over the beginning in 2017, our annual water rate probably would be see, uh, about a little over $200,000. But because of the upgrades to the, um, the domestic water treatment plant and the wastewater treatment plant. That's not done yet. That's not done. That's that's, right. And that's not in the debt that's there that you talked about. Sure. That, yeah. That's, that that's going to add to it. Sure, it's going to add to it. Yeah. Um, but that now constitutes um, a significant portion of what we pay for water and sewer each year. Okay. But the fact that all the, the, and the debt service on those capital improvements for, for us is running well over $100,000 a year. But everybody else now is paying that as well. So, like I said earlier, we are now paying uh, uh, somewhere between three hundred and three hundred fifty thousand dollars per year, which is already a reduction. Significantly, closer to about three hundred than it is to the three fifty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but the key that I want to just the key to that were uh, two things. Number one, as you started alluding to, uh, I was allowed to work directly with the water consultant people at Denver BBC Corporation and their head engineer to look at the rate setting process and make recommendations that were much more equitable for us. And they did that in a succession of steps in our, in our rates to the point of where we are now. So getting our rates in, in order uh, fair was my mind at that point was new only because we were just basically getting screwed. The second thing was that our existing amendment to the, uh, the agreement that, uh, that was signed in 2002, 2003, um, expired in 2013. And there was no provision for how our rates were going to be set after that. And basically, what we did was continue doing as they liked, doing what we had been doing for the last years. Okay, so we 
clearly needed to get some sort of a breakthrough so we could get a new equitable agreement in place uh, that would serve all of the owners of the Cameron and essentially the whole community as well. Um, and that's when the current committee stood up. And in my opinion, what allowed us to break the log jam was Scott talking directly across to his counterpart at ECWC in Glacier, which is Jim Goodman, the uh, chief operating officer of Glacier. And them saying, look, let's let's dispense with a lot of the hacking and everything. Let's agree to some principles. Once we have those principles agreed to, then let's get the wording for contract agreement in place. And that's what has, has happened over the last year. The other key point is that Scott alluded to was this business of fire debt service, because that is a significant portion of what we were paying in the water and what everybody else was doing. Because by our previous agreement, we were not liable to pay for any infrastructure development because we were paying a flat fee that they were supposed to use to do all of the maintenance and all the capital improvements they were supposed to do, but they didn't. Uh, we, uh, uh, don't know that, but uh, we now uh, are able to uh, make sure that the things are set up so that they are responsible for what they need to be responsible for and that there is an equitable way to pass that debt service cost on to us. But what was in question, because our prior agreement, our prior agreement said that they were responsible for all of the improvements and the costs associated with it because everybody was in a particular way paying them. That's not going to happen. So, uh, that, but, but it was, again, it was Scott talking directly to Jim Griffin, I think, and broke the log jam. And, and ultimately to Carl. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's finally got, got that's what really Carl's broke it yeah. free. That's true. Yeah. Right, in, right within the last month or so. Yeah. 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 I mean, suffice it to say, we've been at this for a very long time, and it does date back to 2013. Um, you know, did we end up with uh, everything we wanted? No. The reality is, we uh, our options were simple. We find a way to compromise. We are users of the water. We are beneficiaries of their plan. Um, we could have played hardball, gone into a legal battle. Uh, uh, it wasn't the right thing, in our opinion, to get into a legal battle. Uh, because we would have spent a ridiculous amount of money. And at the end of the day, it was, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, board's uh, decision to move forward and try to negotiate the best we could and get the best deal that we could. And we think we've done that. Um, is it perfect? No, but again, we, there were compromises made on both sides. Uh, and I think, you know, we've gotten to a place where, where, where we are comfortable. Going into arbitration or legal battles, um, they got more zeros behind their pocketbook than we do. And, and I would also point out that, of course, we had uh, Ken as lead counsel watching and reviewing everything to make sure that Cameron's interests were well represented in these negotiations with the new contract. TP, TP. So, in conclusion, do I understand? Am I understanding that all of the work we did on property, installing all those meters for that extended period of time? That everybody kept saying were incorrect readings and they didn't accept them and they redid them. That's now back in place. And we're being charged strictly through that music. We are, yes, everything is tracked and metered now so that we have you know true consumption numbers. We didn't install the meters. They did. Glacier did. Well, at their cost. Dave Dunn was out there many days working with them. You're thinking of the irrigation meters. No, the stuff that went to each building. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. TP yeah. from from 2013 to 2021, all meters have been installed. We have meters. We can measure consumption, and, and that is and that is what's being used and, in the formulas to create the rates. And we're watching that every month as we build. So we have the capability at this point of internally reducing our water usage in many many ways if we see so fit, and we'll reduce our overall bill. Correct. Yep. We would ask that you shower every day. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, I will yes. Just, just to chime in on the one point, there was at one point 
a large disagreement amongst the two parties about water loss. Right. It turns out it was a software issue within their building yeah. system. There's no water loss. Yeah. I shouldn't say no water loss. There, there was not a I huge issue that. on water yeah. loss. Yeah. But again, that was because us going back and forth, back to the well, back to the well. Jerry just beating up uh, um, BBC's model until we finally got to the bottom. Yep. Yep. And you know, it was a big mea culpa from them. They came back and said, oops, we screwed up. And uh, glad we got to the bottom of it because we were convinced they were losing a ridiculous amount of water. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions? Is our yeah. irrigation fee the same as our potable water fee? They're different rates. Different rates. Is it the potable water is for irrigation? Yes. For yes. ours, it is. The only, yes. The only uh, customers who do not use uh, domestic or potable water for uh, irrigation is the Gulf Coast. And that has completely separate accounts uh, in the way to, to retrieve them. About five years ago, five, six years ago, the irrigation water that feeds the golf course, which is comes from the ponds that you see around, was deemed to be not up to standards for watering on residential property. Yeah. So we had to convert, at that time, we had to convert to domestic water for irrigation. Yeah. And that was by Colorado statute. Yeah, yeah, Colorado, that was Colorado statute. Children, and children, and that was a legal mandate. Yeah. To that water for irrigation. It had to be changed. Okay, so um, that's the update, and hopefully we get this done. I will tell you that um, you know, one, one of the things that I was hell-bent to get done and one of the reasons I came back for an extra year was this silly thing that was dragging on. And we wanted to get it done. If you look at where we've come from uh, a reliance on, on Glacier slash ECWC in the last three or four years, uh, our internet's great, our TV's great. We've gotten away from all that. This was kind of the last piece. Um, so... You know, and, and I think this has definitely improved our communications with uh, with Glacier and ECWC too. Um, okay, moving on. Rental program, I'm not gonna provide an update on that. I, I didn't get anything from Heather. I think her plan was just to address it tomorrow in the owner's meeting. Um, so I won't get into that. Um, let's talk about property, Mrs. Barron. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start off going through the uh, operations. You may need to come up here so people can hear you on the mic. Tim, are you going to provide a written? Are you going to provide a written attachment with your report on it? So, sorry, Gil. He used to. He, he used to. He did once. They crossed it off the last board meeting. Killed it when we went for electronic voting. <laughs> uh, starting at six hundred on the income operating. A um, couple of things I wanted to touch. The building maintenance 612 is an account that we buy everything that we need to operate and for billable work orders. It's a, a number that was based on history. Uh, we'll just look at it next budget. Uh, Gambloak. Everything else was in pretty good shape. The uh, salaries thing is low. We are one strong person shy on our grounds people. Uh, Lisa and I updated our posting and we hope to get somebody hired in the next few months. On 800 accounts, the uh, unplanned capital, um, again, that's just a, a historic number. I think we're gonna plan on leaving it. We had a higher expense this year one big project, uh, we gotta be able to adjust. Uh, bat mitigation is gonna be done completely, spending the budget, which we want to continue. Um, all of the projects that we planned on getting done this year will yeah, be executed. Sorry. Yes, sir. On the bat mitigation, uh, seems to me less bat activity this year, at least in my corner of Pine Cone. How about the rest of the property? You getting any, you seeing more bats, less bats? We've seen evidence up at High Point. And we've seen evidence in Pinecone, and we're going to have some numbers to put into the 2022 budget for bat mitigation. The lodge building is completely done. They finished up the program over about a four year pro, uh, pro, uh, time period. And we paid, I think it was $7,000 this year to have a, a, an encompassing, fully encompassing uh, warranty for the next three years on the entire lodge building. 
So we've been, this, we've been at this about three years. Are, are we making progress? We've made big progress. Yeah. Okay. We've, we're nice. done with the lodge. We've done work at High Point. We've done we've done work at the Outliers on an as needed basis. Uh, we have the buildings in all of the locations prioritized and budgeted. So we'll have that conversation, you know, in the next couple of months about what we want to do and why over the next couple of years. But it'll continue in the future because we still do have that. Leave them alone at High Point. I want them to eat the mosquitoes. <laughs> you don't want them in your building. But yours is the first building. Um, anyway, the capital, I was pleased with the capital budgets this year. Uh, we, we reduced our scope significantly on the maintenance office because we couldn't have put up our walls and doors against the code. Um, I think Joe touched on the uh, admin area. We greatly reduced the cost in, in leaving. Uh, Sotheby's where they are. Uh, I think they're on a three-year lease. I would like to revisit that in a couple of years because I think it really truly would be better utilization of the space. But between them and us and some other projects that are higher priority, we all agreed that between us and the Sotheby's, you want to put that off for a few years. Um, lodge drain plumbing project. Uh, over the past few months, we've done some research with consultants on what the condition of our piping is, the drain waste and vent in this lodge building. We have a problem that's been growing for 40 plus years. We're at a point in time where we have to address it. We can no longer be reactive. Um, every week, we are doing a plumbing, a pipe replacement in this building, and it's horribly inefficient. It's horribly impactful on ownership and staff. Uh, so we have received a proposal from an engineer who specializes in lodge in plumbing piping replacement projects, and uh, we have a proposal from them. I've asked the board to approve the first step, which is a pre-programming and planning phase, uh, including engineering, at which the end of the, uh, the end of this phase, we will have engineered drawings and three competitive bids for a pipe replacement in this lodge building. Um, it's not anything that we can talk about for three or four years. We've got to go do this or else we're going to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars unnecessarily being reactive in fixing pipes as we find the problems. Uh, I sent a memo out to the board in June and asked that they approve the first expenditure for this first step, which was $160,000, including engineering. Are we back to pipe replacement versus sleeving or lining? The only portion of the system that is a good candidate for lining is the exits of the sewer service lines that go from the building out to the main. And those that cost a hundred grand to do all 12 or 15, <clears throat> however many lines go out to the main. And that's still, that's gonna be the only portion that we line. The rest of it is gonna be- That's not where the problems are, right? I mean, the big yeah, problems are in the building. Yeah, it needs to be done. No, it's, I mean, we ran cameras down from the roof all the way down to the, to the service main and the mains have to be addressed, but it's a different process. So I guess I'd like the board to approve that so we can move forward. Well, I guess it'll I'm going to deal with it in the final session. No, okay. And then it'll be a budget. And it's a budget. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't have it in the budget for this year. So it's something we have to address. We had, we had 50,000 to address this in this year's budget. Yeah, that was for a different I process. I think we were, so. we were planning on doing concept, one, yep. one or yeah. two stacks in the yeah, lodge when we didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Ron had a question. <clears throat> Ron? Just curious. Uh, uh, one of the big consumers of water are, are old toilets. Mm -hmm. And presuming that when we accomplish this large project, uh, we should all be looking forward to replacing all of our toilets with low flow. And, con and reducing our consumption of water and, and therefore a water bill. And I'm sure you're considering that in your total calculation of well, cost to the community. The, the, the plumbing fixtures themselves belong to the ownership of the units. And we've also mm -hmm. been proactive in asking owners to take a look at their water heaters, to take a look at their water valves. Uh, I mean, every couple of weeks we get, we're getting toilets running and et cetera. We go replace the guts in the toilet and send the bill to, for $100 or whatever it is to the ownership. And that's just been a- But like, in, a in this old lodge, with this old plumbing, we need the excess flow of water in the old style toilets to clear <coughs> our waste from mm -hmm. the building, correct? Mm -hmm. 
And I think we all would jump on the low flow toilets at, at the proper time. We could send out a note and ask people to consider that. But not yet. No, I, I think once we determine how we're going to move forward, yeah. there will be a lot of suggestions like that yeah. on how we just have to make changes. I mean, without a doubt. Yeah. Toilets aren't expensive. No, they're not. Yeah. And it's an own expense. I mean, with the, all we can do is make a recommendation, no, but they're not expensive to your point. $240,000. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you buy it's pretty high <laughs> 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 All they pay. <laughs> Um, Tim, I have a question. So yes. um, we talked about this before, but with the replacing the pipes, mm -hmm. the displacement of the individuals that are in the lodge, have we come up with any? Well, the first costs? recommendation from the engineer was we're absolutely going to find that the cost of the overall project is significantly lower, lower when we keep the units occupied significantly. But it is something that we are going to ask them to con to include in their uh, survey and their analysis of the project so that we'll have a strong, we'll have a big number says, here's why you want to do it with the units occupied. And we'll have the cost comparison if we have to displace everybody, relocate them, pack everything. And there's a lot of, there's a significant scope of work required to relocate people. Uh, and I've asked them, I said, we've got to have a good, a good bit of research on why we want to do this with people in place. And that's part of the program. We do have a great committee for this project. Uh, Kathy's on it, Boyd's on it, uh, Eric's on it. I think that's us, the, the force. And Anybody wants to and join the party? Yes. <laughs> Especially just, somebody who lives in the lodge. <laughs> we're not going to like the end numbers in the end, just to be yeah. clear. It's not, you know, this is a big project and it is something that um, unfortunately is just a result of having a 40 year old. Yeah. Building full iron bikes. We did not know that it to the significance of it. And that's why we need to get a consultant to help us out. Yes, sir. Is there a ballpark? Is this a million dollar project, five million dollar project? You know, if Somebody you'd asked me that a year ago, I'd said yes. But mm -hmm. materials and transportation yeah. have, I mean, it is it is just you know, it's horrible to try to guess what something's going to cost, knowing that I'm not even going to start it for how many months. I mean, I tried to get a budget from the engineers and they said, well, you should carry this number. And then an hour before my last board meeting, they said, oh, you better triple it because of transportation and materials. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's let's just see what it's going to cost when we get through the bidding process. Yeah, that's the first piece we need to get done. Is get, get the consultants in here, get the, yeah. you know, the consultants will then work with us to get multiple bids and figure out, you know, how, how, we'll have to figure out from there how do we move forward. Yeah. And then we'll start making decisions for it. Um, Tim, didn't you tell me that they, this company you've been working with, uh, did a forty-story thing in Denver, and everybody got to stay there? Yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody relocated, and that's a lot, a lot bigger than this. No, I started researching contractors who specialize in it, and that attracted me to Sagewater, who's doing a forty-story residential condo in uh, in Denver. So I went down and met with them, met with the engineers, met with the consultants, and was I was scared to death trying to do this work. An occupied building, and uh, you know, it's, it's what they do for a living every day. It's pretty so amazing. they just reroute the pipes, right? Or like if they're going to come into my condo in here, they'd reroute my water and sewage. No, we reroute you in the living room, <laughs> <laughs> and we replace the pipes. At the end of every day, you'll be able to use your bathroom. So, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe not one night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions before we move off the water? I mean, the pipes, I should say. Yeah. Okay. Um, other stuff that's happened this year, um, we had our fire department inspection, which happens every five years, went extremely well, had the punch list done in about 45 days, which including the steps and the rails. Um, our staffing has really made great progress and we're expanding the areas of work that we do, that we self-perform. Like we would have never replaced a fan light heater unit in the lodge. We would have called an electrician and spent $200 on labor, having a half an hour's worth of work done. But we do that. We, we used to outsource drywall, repair, texture, paint. We do that in-house. Uh, we're finding photo cells out in the outlier uh, parking lots, the exterior lighting. We now can replace photo cells without taking any great risk and greatly reducing cost. Um, so with our, I'm just tickled to death with our staff on our maintenance side, we've got some work. We've got to build up a stronger foundation in our ground staff, but we're making great progress. 
Um, I don't know how to, I would like to ask for ideas for capital improvement projects. I mean, I've got a couple that I would like to put on the list for consideration, but if anybody has something that they see out there that they, they would like to put on the list for consideration under the next budget meeting, please send me an email. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts. I've got about four items here that I'd like to propose, but we'll talk about that at the next budget meeting. Which will happen likely mid-November. Yeah, so that's all I've got. Okay, well, you wanna update us on the cameras? Oh, security cameras? Security cameras and the access to the for the owners to be able to look at the cameras. Oh, well, we put 26 cameras in the lodge. Yeah. So all of our entry points are covered. Uh, we can record data for you know, 30, 45 days or something. Uh, we installed two cameras in each of the four parking lots and those will be accessible <laughs> via the web. I don't know when, but. He's gonna get back to me. Bo's yeah. gonna get back to me. Yeah, that was part of the uh, part of the reason we wanted to share two reasons. One, we've got a, one camera that's focused on the entry of the parking lots so we can see if there's somebody breaks into a car in high point i've got a record of who came into the parking lot we did not get 100 percent coverage of the parking lots but we do have an extra camera that shows whether it's snowed or not so that's serving a double purpose on the, on the extra cameras any other questions scott no, that's all i have okay. any questions from Anybody, anything on online there, Pierre? Not about that. <clears throat> uh, there's a comment about the fire thing and the board judging fire safety. <laughs> We're not judging fire safety for the record. We're judging whether or not something like that can even be installed here. So, and it's been shelved. Um, well, Lisa, I don't know what you're referring to, but you're more than welcome to email us directly. Is that it? Okay. <clears throat> um, rules and regs. Um, I don't know if we had any formal report. Did Ron, Ron, did we have anything formal for rules and regs? I know there were some suggestions we talked about pet policy. Um, and we did want to open up the rules and regs to talk about the parking pet. So if you'll go ahead and open that up. Rules and regs, do you open up a good document to talk about our parking? Is that? Is that rules and regs or where was that? But the parking, the long-term parking. Oversized vehicles. Vehicle. Is, that, vehicle. is that all covered in the rules and regs now? Because yes. I'm looking at the parking and I don't see anything that talks about occupancy of a of an RV. Yeah, not in there. If it's not in there, then that's, that's what we wanted to look at. And that's why I was wondering if, if that new thing with the, you know, the $10 a night for the reserve parking, is that a policy somewhere else? Um, how, how did we do the parking policy? Do you recall? Was it, it was it was it under rules and regs? And that it was, was in rules and regs. We okay. modified parking policy to include the program for oversized oversized vehicles. Within the rules and regs document. Yes. It, see, there's nothing in there that says it's it doesn't. There's nothing in there about the parking and ten bucks a night and the you that can't occupy. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Snowmobile boats. Yeah. Or right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Trailers, snowmobiles. Right there. Oh, there it is. Sorry, skipped over it. It says RVs, moving trailers will park 48 hours, loading and unloading. It should all be there. But it, but it does it say anything about whether an RV can be occupied? It says well, the owners and tenants, tenants must be in residence. residence. Does, so that I means to me, that clearly says you've got to be in a unit yeah. to yeah. be able to park here. Yeah. Yeah, but you're speaking of residence in the RV. No, here well, not we're, not what we're trying to address oh. is whether or not I don't somebody think, can stay. You don't occupied. require any yeah. owners to reside in, a, in an RV, Ron. <laughs> I don't think that clearly says that our, an RV can be used as a domicile while it's parked. Right. I don't think. It's well, and, and I think what yeah, we're saying is that we're going to we want to prohibit it from being used as a domicile yeah. while it's parked. Yeah. Well, we, okay. So we, we need to tweak that. Yeah. yeah, and we talked about that before. Special consideration. <clears throat> right. 
get that. Yeah, if I've got a handicapped man oh. and my dad comes. No, I get it. I remember there. us talking about it. Right. There, was a, there was an exception yeah. clause yeah. that we had. Yeah. Because it was, yeah, authority for staff to grant that, right? Yes. Yeah. Just like yeah. that. Yeah. So we, so. <laughs> no. We felt very hard not to grant that much. Yeah. I need some more trainers. Okay. Is there a two week, is there a 14 day maximum on that as well? I don't see that there either. I thought we had time frames on these. I just saw 30 days. Yeah, yeah. I saw 30 days. Yeah. Yeah, that refers yeah that refers to a vehicle parked in one spot for more than 30 days. Any vehicle anywhere on the truck. <coughs> okay, so it sounds like we need to add a time frame associated with a trailer, and we also need to clarify the occupancy of an RV um, being prohibited unless yeah. there's some kind of special provision or approval. You refer this yeah. to the chair or to the lead. Yeah, we'll right. we'll send it over to. Or we'll get we'll get it updated. We'll send it over to Ron and we'll get it updated. Or whoever the sucker is that gets rolling right in the day. <laughs> yeah. While we're while we're here, Gary, if you can page it down just one line. No, down. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> the board talks about hang tags. Go back a couple of paragraphs. One more line there. Okay. Uh, owners and tenants will obtain a camera and parking hang tag. We still do not have hang tags. Hang tags, is that correct? We, no, we, no, we do. Yeah. So, Tim, there was a discussion before you got here about um, whether if it's a trailer and the vehicle's detached, where does the hang tag go? On the vehicle or apply it to the vehicle? To the, they have to okay. apply it to the vehicle that's sitting, that's the sitting there. No, that, that, that doesn't apply to RV. That, that applies to every vehicle on property, the way I'm reading it. That's not quite my trade. Where is that word? Owners or tenants. And have no. one vehicle for licensed driver. That's saying the every car needs that. That's what it says. Oh, that's all yeah. You know what we talked about a couple of years ago, we talked about getting those. Okay. And, that's and it just never really. So that, 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 that needs to be things to be reviewed. That's yeah. all. That was yeah. my point. That either yeah. needs to go away. Also, or, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. there was yeah. also a comment made about the hang tags that are going on the RVs and stuff that they need to be waterproof. I mean, oh. so you know what? You know what they do in Texas? They slap it in the baggie and use a zip tie. Or There's we just no tape it to the inside of the window. Oh, whatever. Yeah, I don't care. care. They're talking about where they should paint. <clears throat> I understand what you're saying. I'm not too sure that comes in. Do we have a towing company capable of no, I, I just that they they put, put it in a Ziploc bag? Right. They're responsible for making sure that it doesn't get destroyed by the animals. Yeah. <clears throat> do we have a towing company that yes. has a truck that can remove these RVs? Yes. If push came to shove? Yes. Just apply for it. Okay. Yep. And I'm waiting. There's one more sign that they have to provide for us to be able to tow. And he, this was a fellow that bought a new truck like two months ago, and I don't have my signs yet. He was waiting for a PUC license. But yes, we have a towing company that is okay. ready to respond. Okay. And there are lots of regulations associated mm -hmm. with towing a vehicle. <laughs> okay. So suffice it to say, we will address those <laughs> items and <laughs> update the rules and regs. <laughs> Because we had a, uh, a rather robust discussion early on uh, about rules and regs, is there any comments or suggestions of things that need to be addressed in the rules and regs? If not, I, I don't think so. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're not talking about the, the boot anymore. We've talked about that a couple of times. The boot the booting cars. That yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the decision to go away from that is. Was, was, was good. Yeah. Ron, did you have a question? Uh, not about the uh, automobiles, but a general question about rules and regs. <laughs> um, Boyd, could you go over the rules and regs for what an owner may display outside their front door, whether it be in the lodge or in the outlying uh, clusters? In other words, can I put a Christmas wreath up? Can I put my name on my door? Can I put a, a welcome mat in the hallway? Ron, yeah, that in fact is a law that came into place, I think, September the 1st. Colorado just passed a law 
dealing with that. And our rules and regs guys have not had a chance yet to propose or to, to get owner feedback and then to propose something to add to our rules and regs. It's it's brand new and we we're we're, we're nine days behind schedule, but we're we're and you think that would, you think that would refer to welcome mats as well? It could be trip hazards in hallways. I don't my reading on um, Ken, I don't know, I think you and maybe Christina have maybe looked at this. I my my reading is it's banners. It would not apply to floor mats, but that's enough. That's a do, do, what, do what we have presently apply to floor, floor mats? Because I can <laughs> I can just see a problem with 15 of us down a hallway with floor mats. I, I don't trip think over. we even have anything in Mulder Rex talking about that to my knowledge. So okay. it's a if safety issue. It's, it's not prohibited. We need to add, then we need to, right. we need to look at it. Yeah. yeah. If you yeah. think it's a safety issue, please, you know, yeah, document so it's it. It's currently it not prohibited. Yeah. Not, so I don't believe match? it's ever been addressed. It's the yeah. first time yeah. I've heard it. I've never, yeah, I've never heard anything. Okay. Uh, has there been that just been promulgated in the uh, Common Ownership Act, the Colorado law that we should look for to get more guidance? Yeah, I think it was, yeah, I think it was accepted in June with an effective date of September the 1st. So yes, it's, it's out there. Uh, a lot of June 24th, if I remember correctly, but whatever. Yeah, it's it's the, it's the Trump banner law. <laughs> well, it's American flags. I mean, we do have people who display American flags, you know, and we've never addressed that as a board. Now, Colorado law requires us to address it. Yeah, so it's something we'll have to do. <clears throat> um, so, any other comments, rules and regs? Again, I would recommend if anybody ever has things that they think we need to address, bring it up. We'll look at it. I have a whole bunch, so you don't want them right now. But I did notice that um, Gary might want to update where it's talking about um, getting a hold of maintenance or whatever if it's not an emergency, but now we're supposed to use that online. Ventium, right? Yeah, that probably needs to be added into here. So I don't know where to go. I, I think it's on the face on the website, probably. If you want to just submit your suggestions, I've done it before, it sounds like you're ready to roll. So yeah. just send them on over. Yeah. We'll look at them. <clears throat> Yeah, just get them over to us, and it's something that whoever, as I said, is the lucky recipient of rules and regs, we'll uh, we'll, we'll start digging into. Yeah. We took going back to the floor mat. I think I, I hope you guys. I think that should be addressed. I don't know it's not a problem. There's one person right here that has one. You can see it looks like somebody tripped over it, and then if everybody's putting a floor mat out there, and they're you have one, I have another one. Everybody else, I mean, it would look it would look trash. I'm gonna I'm gonna hope nobody wants to put a format out because I've got a vacuum. Yeah, and, and there's that's, another problem too. So, so that's your yeah. <clears throat> it's your tenant. I saw that for the first time this morning. <laughs> yeah, well, it just needs to be yeah, talked about. It. Yeah. Anything else? You touched on on pets. I'll just say that I have received emails from a couple of owners uh, following up on on Gary's uh, publishing of our existing pet policy. Um, those two owners are. Uh, suggesting an expansion of the uh, number of owners who and guests who are allowed to have pets on property. My thought is this hasn't been addressed in a while. We've got a lot of new owners. Um, I frankly don't know what the ownership thinks at this point. And I would think maybe doing a survey, asking owners <coughs> what they think about our current pet policy and changes to it might be a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. It's been a, it's been a, um, an emerging trend that we're, we have to deal with. Yeah, and I'll just add to it because I'm a pet lover. <clears throat> it, I, I, I agree. I think it needs to be looked at hard. I think whatever the rules are, everyone needs to follow it. Um, one thing that's been in the minutes from time to time, maybe every other set of minutes is the discussion of the dog park. Um, it's really, it, and, and, and I just- You want to donate some land? <laughs> uh, <laughs> buy it first. No, no problem. <clears throat> something to do with glacier. There's just no doubt. There's no other way. We, we've it. had discussions with them, and we'll continue but, to try to but solve. It's for hard it. to have, um, you know, for, for dog owners, other than going off site, um, it's hard to comply with the rules as they are. But we do. It's good to have an option, and an option would be a dog park, and that would take care of a lot of problems that um, dog haters, and there's dog haters, in as much as there's dog lovers. And a dog park would take care of everyone's concerns. Well, we, we don't disagree that it's something that would be helpful. Plus, plus the coyotes attack at night. Yeah. <laughs> what we don't have is any land to put one in. So no, it's something that we'd have to solve for the pleasure. We've had discussions with pleasure on it. They have the same they, they have the same concerns. Um, they are seeing more and more people show up with pets. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's just something we need to 
we need to address. The demographic with the price of these places, with obviously more people will be moving in as either half time or full time homes. They'll have dogs. It's going to get more of a population. And, and from an owner perspective, it's not an issue. That's not what causes the heartburn. Mm -hmm. What causes the heartburn is owner's family that show up, tenants that show up, yeah. and our inability to police somebody coming in a back door with a dog. Well, and, and even owners, and as a dog lover, I'll say that there's some owners that just may um, be a little. But they may not follow the rules, that I get. <laughs> <laughs> but they are allowed to have pets. If they just don't clean pets, up after themselves. There's nowhere the poops were left on the ground. Yeah, I, I get it. Believe me, we we've seen pictures of poop and pooping dogs, and <laughs> we're sharing. We need to get uh, Diane and Ray involved with this. She had done some work on this previously. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, can, can I can I interject one thing here? I knew it was coming. You knew I was, was trying coming. to get my pass before you did. I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, and I I don't have a dog. I love dogs, but I don't have a dog. I'll tell you right now, the vast majority of problems that we have with dogs, with dogs off leash, with people not picking up, are owners of dogs. And if what we do is inter introduce. <clears throat> the ability for more people to have dogs on property, you are just gonna have more problems. <clears throat> that's all that's gonna happen. And, what's, and, and then what's gonna happen is people are gonna say, well, maintenance isn't enforcing the rules or Gary isn't enforcing the rules. All of us have far better things to do with our time and more productive things to do with our time than looking out after dog shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we do. That's just, that's just the world. If you want more dogs here, you're going to have more problems. And what you really need then is a security team. And then it's going to cost you money to have a security team that goes around and polices dogs, uh, whether whether people are picking up after them, polices whether whether or not they're on leash. It's just going to be a headache. Keep that in mind, whatever you decide. I think you start effing the signs and you really find them before doing it. We find. We find quite a, quite a number. Yeah. But again, it yeah, comes down to enforcement, enforcement and evidence. Agreed. I mean, we're not taking DNA tests to dog food, right? <laughs> so it's I, I I understand the point. Okay, enough on that. I think just for the record, we've talked about this every court meeting <laughs> for the last eight years. So. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, there's Caiuses all over the place too. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, next I thing I had was a lecture reminder, which I think I've already covered, so we don't need to go there. Uh, unfinished business? You guys got anything that we need to address in unfinished business? I, I don't think there's anything we haven't already covered, but yeah, Brian. I, I would like to take just a few minutes. We've been off property for two years now. Um, and have uh, come back and had the opportunity to observe probably the result of two years worth of effort. Um, we operate a very similar business. We're in retail. We can't do it remotely. We need employees. We need to get them to show up. We need to have proper sanitation and so forth and, and everything in our restaurants. Um, I just want to say that the, the owners who have been here for the last two years, this board, particularly the staff, I would like to congratulate you. The place <clears throat> looks spectacular after two years. Now I'm getting old and my memory is getting poorer. <laughs> However, it presents fabulously. So I wanna thank you. I know there are a lot of details you've talked about in the budget that you've not completed. They don't show what shows is spectacular. So Appreciate from it. us, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, so it, it, it's been a, uh, uh, you know, it's, as Jerry alluded to another, <clears throat> we've, we've had a good cooperative board and we've gotten a lot done. And, um, and it's a continuing to... problem. We have 650,000 deaths and counting. Our hospital ICU beds are absolutely full. This is far from over. Um, we are not going to find an employee. In two months' time, I don't care what kind of ad you put out, you're going to go through a number of them because they're not going to like the pay. They're not going to like the, the conditions. It is a way of life until we can destroy COVID or beat it down to the point where it's only a flu. So we've, we, we've got to stay vigilant. 
and active. And that's one of the reasons my wife and I struggle to try and continue to wear masks. Thank you. Well, I, I may be wrong, but it seems like we had an additional person for each cluster in years past and Taryn started this year with none of them. And it's just, it's been difficult without going up somewhere north of 40, $50 an hour to mow lawns. We can't get people. Not just because yeah. 15, $20 an hour, they get a job in town. They're not gonna drive up here for that same money. So we've been struggling and thank you. Ron. Yeah, landscape's not the only problem. We can, we can learn to appreciate weeds, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the other details that you all have taken care of that I can see, again, is just spectacular. And I, you know, I also wanna recognize, and I think you did this, but just to be clear, this is because of the, of the you know the staff that we have. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's been a they, they're they're working more hours. They're covering more than they used to have to because of staffing shortages. Um, but certainly having Tim and Lissa here and um, having you know Gary as a constant has you know that, that that's why we see Lucy. Did you have a question? I thought I saw a hand, but you're kind of yes, out of the hole. Yes, I wanted. I just want to say kudos to Tim. He has been very helpful to my husband and I um, and his team. His team just Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any new business? Anything we need to address? Because we're going to break into executive committee here. So, um, if there's anything, any new business we need to address, um, let us know. Do you want to mention that the owner's reception is tonight at six thirty in the basement? Go ahead. The owner's reception is at yeah. tonight at six thirty in the base camp. Done. Be there. Nice second. Yes. All right. Well, we appreciate you guys. So just so everybody knows, for those of you online, we break into an executive session, um, we pause the meeting, we will come back in and reopen it and share anything that we may have may or may not have addressed, and then we'll probably close it out. So, but by law, no actions will be taken during the executive session. Yeah. Correct. Need there is no time. You should have a motion to adjourn. No, 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 no. Move into executive session. Second. 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 Uh, for, and for those, on, for those people who are on, I'm sorry. For those people who are online, what Zoom does, if you've got 40 minutes of inactivity, it may end the meeting. So in 40 minutes, Zoom may just kick us off because this meeting is going to be idle. The, the board meeting is going to be idle while the executive session meeting is in in progress. Okay. Have you turned off recording? Uh, that's what I'm going to do now. So do I need to restart?